Dear students, invited speakers, uh, faculty and global audience, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2022 edition of the Lund Architecture Symposium, LAS22. Uh, my name is Per Johan Dahl, and I'm your host at this year's uh, symposium. The Lund Architecture Symposium is an annual event uh, organized by the Department of Architecture and the Built Environment uh, here at Lund University in Sweden. The purpose uh, is to identify contemporary tendencies within architecture discourse uh, to make those tendencies accessible to students and faculty at the department. And before we jumpstart this exciting and rather packed uh, day of lectures and discussions, uh, I have some general information uh, for, for you. First of all, I would like to uh, thank our sponsors that has made this event possible. Uh, Architect Sweden Scania, eller Sveriges arkitekt i Skåne. Uh, Architects, uh, Architect Sweden, um, City of Lund, and uh, City of Malmö. Thank you. Um, I also would like to pay my gratitude to our research assistant, Valentina uh, Rapuano, um, who has been working with the graphics and been generally involved in the work organizing this uh, symposium, as well as uh, Helen Svenningson, who is marketing and organizing us, who is working with it. Thanks. I'm obliged to point out the fire exits here. Uh, we have fire exits there, for you guys up there. There's a fire exit there, and there's a fire exit there, so now I've done that. And uh, I'm also obliged to inform you that this event is being recorded for archival and educational purposes. And finally, also, please switch off your cell phones. So, the 2022 edition of Lund Architecture Symposium engages in architectural practices that takes an active position within the urgency of societal restructuring. We are interested in examples and aspects of intervention uh, where architects uh, use the design of buildings and landscapes as a generative force uh, to reimagine space and form beyond the norms that dictate them. This symposium is contextualized in an observation that during recent years, architecture uh, has frequently been used to communicate the conditions of uh, life and culture that emerge in the wake of societal restructurings. We have, for example, uh, seen footages from, from numerous environmental catastrophes where architecture has been used to measure the level of ramification, uh, last summer we had the flooding in Belgium and, and Germany, uh, where media instantly used uh, the scale of buildings to reference the scale of flooding. We had the Dixie Fire in Northern California, where the magnitude was confirmed by the number of destroyed buildings. And of course we had all the media coverage of Covid lockdowns, where people were prohibited from leaving uh, their buildings, succumbing to a life inside architecture, while the surrounding urban environments of socio-economic encounters were struggling to survive. In all of these cases, uh, architecture was often used as a passive counterpart uh, to the effects of social re restructurings. Rarely did we see any attempts of architecture to react, uh, to take an active position within these ramifications. We didn't see much architecture that had been specifically designed with the purpose of combating the social implications of surging pandemics. We hardly saw any buildings that had been designed to interact with the flooding. Hence the idea behind this, uh, this symposium to engage with architecture that takes an active role in, and position in societal restructurings. Questions to be asked uh, are, for example, uh, what if the looming perils of surging environments could serve as incentives for the design of new building forms and ways of organized space? What if the socio-economic and political upheavals we are facing in the contemporary could catalyze innovations in how we shape and program urban landscapes? Can the architect take a leading role in, the ch in challenging the conventions and reactionary mindsets that continue to repress uh, em emergent or alternative economies and cultures? So these questions and other we hope to kind of touch upon and discuss here during, during the day. In the title of this year's symposium, 
we have a re in the brackets, uh, which adds information to the term activating without changing its meaning. This is to underline that architecture actually has a long history in reacting to changing societies. Uh, we could go uh, way back to exemplify this, uh, but if we start at the 19th century, we had, for example, architects like Henri Labrust and Louis Sullivan, who um, embraced steel construction techniques that were, that were loathed by disciplinary conventions at the time. Doing so, they basically reinvented architecture as we know it today. Following Labrust and, and Sullivan, uh, the modern movement literally used architectural design to galvanize new materials and construction principles uh, for combating social in inequalities and poor living environments. I mean, Le Corbusier's discourse is really an architectural compilation of the city reforms and technical innovations that were ushered in in the early 20th century. In the 1960s and 70s, we had constellations such as Archigram, uh, Superstudio and Ant Farm that used architecture to reconceptualize the social and political upheavals they experienced in, the, in their contemporary. And in the 90s, we had Livius Woods, who explored the generative intersections between war and architecture, a research that resonates in the most uncanny way at this year's symposium. And today, we do, of course, have practices that continue to build upon this tra tradition Hence, the aim of this seminar to uh, communicate examples of buildings and ideas where such practices have used design as an active force in societal restructurings. We are interested in architects that have developed tools, methods and skills uh, to not only respond to the needs and dreams in emerging societies, but also utilize these features uh, as core components in their design practices. And while doing so, they actually also produce new knowledge for the discipline of architecture itself. So we are proud to have five of these practices with us here today, uh, spanning the geography from Los Angeles in Southern California to Paris in France, Kranzberg in Southern Germany, uh, Copenhagen in Denmark, and a nomadic practice moving between Beit Sahur in Palestine and Stockholm here in Sweden. Um, our guests will share their approaches and, uh, on architectural design as an active force in societal restructuring. We are also, of course, excited to run this year's symposium as a true hybrid event uh, with guests uh, and audiences attending both virtually and in real life um, here at Lund University. So, the symposium has been structured um, through one morning session and one afternoon session. While the morning session will focus on architects that address socio-political complexities uh, in history and identity, the afternoon will, will revolve around social aspects and reuse uh, as engines of innovation. Both sessions will conclude with a moderated discussion. Uh, we have two pairs of moderators. Uh, who will serve as our guides through this day by introducing the guests and uh, moderating the panel discussions. We will not uh, have any time for, quest for questions after each lecture, um, but we will invite all participants to join the conversations uh, by asking questions during the moderated discussions that follow uh, the, the, the lectures. Uh, at the moderated discussions, you will be able to post questions uh, uh, on the chat or the menti.com. Uh, there is a code somewhere uh, behind me, I guess, for this. Uh, and also ask in real life questions if you are sitting in the, in the room here. Um, uh, so I encourage all of you to write down your questions uh, during the lectures and join the conversations um, during the moderated discussions. So, we start this morning's session uh, where we will have um, Gunnar Sandin, um, Associate Professor at the Department of Architecture and the Built Environment, uh, to serve as a moderator. And to manage the questions uh, in the, the menti.com, uh, we have asked Fredrik Linander, lecturer at the same department, so, to assist in moderation. 
And for the morning session, we also have uh, asked head of the architecture school, uh, Jesper Magnusson, to serve as a discussant to join the two, two uh, guests uh, in the moderated discussion. But now I give the word to Gunnar and wish you all an inspiring day. Thank you very much, Per Johan. And welcome all of you here in the room and remote uh, to this morning session. Uh, we have, as Peiwan said, two presentations followed by a panel discussion. The presentations are around 40 minutes and the panel discussion around half an hour. And uh, as Peiwan said, we ask you to put your questions and save them for the panel discussion afterwards, either through what you remotely can see on your screens or what you see here uh, above my head uh, as, as a code. Uh, Frederick and I will collect the questions and repeat them preferably here so that they can be clearly understood by everybody independently of where, where you are located. Our first speaker this morning is Lina Hotme, and I think she is with us or should appear on the screen. Yes, I see her now. Uh, uh, of Lebanese origin, uh, with her office in Paris, who is known for her design of buildings that stand out as very articulated objects in the urban fabric that surrounds them and in the political situation that surrounds them. Buildings like the Estonian National Museum uh, and Stone Garden in Lebanon both have the quality of collecting the very history of the place where they sit. In Estonia, more precisely in Tartu, the project started by winning a competition in 2006 and finished 10 years later to open at a site that had carried the heavy history of a Soviet military base. The Stone Garden project in Beirut, finished in 2020, was particular also uh, uh, as a subject of an exhibition in last year's uh, Venice Biennale, where one could follow the origins and the specific aesthetics, its construction principles and the crafting techniques used in this building. Uh, it showed Lina Chotmes and her office's occupation with architecture's relation to the specific history of the site, uh, with its war-ridden history, to the local building traditions, including the climate-sensitive use of natural resources, yet still a building that also represents renewal and future. We are very happy that to have you here as a guest today, Lina, and I thereby leave the word to you. Thank you so much, uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre uh, John, and uh, thank you for this introduction. I'm really happy to uh, be among you, and um, uh, I excuse myself not to be in person with you as well. Uh, I'm uh, also very honored to be uh, along with all the esteemed uh, invitees for this uh, whole day symposium. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward for re your reactions. Uh, I think uh, every time a presentation is really a dialogue actually and uh, a way to, to build upon and to continue thinking about how to make architecture and what meaning actually architecture has uh, on the built scape. Um, I start uh, this uh, presentation with this uh, view of Earth. And uh, actually last week I was in Canada and one of my students was saying uh, it's a bit strange what's happening in the world at the moment, all the challenges that we are facing. It's contradictory to the fact that as a designer uh, and as a student today when I start my project I just open up with Google and I have Earth like this kind of a view of a one Earth that we live upon and um, which makes us question also how do we how do we work and how do we relate uh, more specifically to, to that Earth 
and what position actually humanity has uh, become uh, on on that planet, knowing that we became a dominant force in shaping the face of uh, of that um, planet. <coughs> and as we know, actually. As we know that um, uh, two years ago, again, uh, Earth had become at the crossover point and um, we already actually exceeded the anthropogenic uh, or the biomass of Earth and the anthropogenic mass is uh, exceeding. Uh, in a way, uh, like the biomass uh, on, uh, on Earth and that uh, this is happening nonetheless, uh, even if we as individuals were more microbes than humans. So uh, and human cells do constitute, uh, are constituted uh, of 43% um, of nature, of uh, microscopic colonists, and then probably the rest is human. Makes us think of uh, some of the paintings of Archimboldo, where we see this uh, uh, composition of the human being uh, made out of fruits or vegetables, so of organic matter. So that such a situation also uh, makes us question how much nature and architecture, how, how does it fit the context and environment and how, how do we integrate uh, that organicity that we still uh, probably don't know uh, quite uh, deeply uh, today. Makes me think also of uh, like landscapes that I've seen in Beirut growing up in that city where nature is always part of uh, architecture in an organic way uh, and ruins and uh, left out spaces. So moving from there, the question of building uh, for me becomes that of an emergence instead of an object that sits on an environment. So how can a building, how can an architecture become an emergence, a discovery, uh, can tell the story of uh, its uh, origin, but also as a kind of an evolution uh, from uh, a typology, from a history. And also as a process of working, thinking about this uh, complexity that is an act of building and of uh, making space in a uh, context and an environment that encompass uh, references, research, theoretical questioning, a historical questioning, but also always a multimedia work that involves the hand as an essential medium that brings this relationship, this close relationship that we have with matter and with the environment, moving from uh, digital uh, tools, but also keenly uh, keeping that uh, presence of the hand in the act of making. So as an office, uh, in my practice, we think about architecture as positioned between archaeology, between uh, humanity, between nature and future. Somehow when we're thinking about archaeology, we're thinking about the past, about the act of digging, of researching, of uh, uh, looking at the memory of a place and bringing a sense of belonging. When we're thinking about humanity, we're in a sense uh, thinking about society, about the inhabitants of such a place that we're designing. Uh, nature is constantly present, it's our context, it's the sustainability of what we build in an environment, how it relates to the land in which it sits, uh, but also a future as it's a new figure or a new presence that uh, would emerge, that would question and have its own originality. So as uh, you introduced uh, earlier, uh, I happen to like growing up in Beirut, actually, and thinking uh, the, the, the role of an architect uh, in a post-war landscape, it happened that uh, I started also my practice with a very particular project, which was a competition that was uh, open um, for like architects to submit and uh, and it was the the Estonian National Museum in Tartu in uh, Estonia. And it is particular because at that time, Estonia in 91 had gained its 
independence from the Soviet uh, Union and Soviet times. Uh, and in 2003, he had started the planning for doing this national museum, which uh, talks about this collection, this ethnographic collection that they have been collecting over time to assert their identity, but also assert their belonging to Finno Ugric culture. So, how objects can narrate the history of uh, a country. And had in 2005 launched this international competition for building this 34,000 square meters building that talks about also uh, ethnographic work, the act of making as an act of resisting. And some of the uh, works that are uh, collected and exhibited in that museum are those of this beautiful uh, like textile artist, uh, Anu Raud, that uh, had done these wonderful landscapes actually knitted uh, that reflect on uh, the context of, uh, of that uh, like a country, but also the cities that we see within. And uh, that project also, what's particular is, is that it sits on this kind of a large uh, landscape, but uh, also a landscape that we see that is not very dense in terms of the construction around, although it's very close to Tartu, like the city center, which is the cultural capital also of Estonia. And no, looking at uh, why actually that uh, like place had been left out, one notices that there is this kind of uh, cut in the landscape that sits uh, there. And uh, digging into the history of that uh, ground, one discovers that basically the first uh, museum was established there, the like ethnographic museum, which was taking over the house of a German noblesman, which is which sits on uh, on that uh, area, but that also this was the place where the largest military airfield had been set on uh, the landscape. So this kind of uh, uh, runway that scars uh, the, the ground that uh, kind of continues over kilometers, but also bears in a certain way, like this heavy memory also of that moment of uh, manifestation of uh, like uh, seeking an independence from uh, what they call the occupation at that uh, point. And uh, at the same time, it bears that memory of these sounds of airplanes, bombarding airplanes that were just landing on that ground. And of course, during the competition, uh, there was not a lot of talk about that ground because that's um, like bearing this kind of negative uh, emotion that uh, the, the, the site had uh, had. Uh, but as architects, we wondered how do we take a, a basically transform that uh, ground? How do we transform that history into a positive one? Take advantage of that space actually that exists and uh, we appropriated into the museum and make that ground a place where Estonians could drive their memory, where they could produce their culture as well, like an open space for interpretation and for appropriation. And actually proposing that the building gained a different dimension, that of the public dimension where Estonians started manifesting for the first uh, establishment of the building and the construction of it. And uh, it became a place for uh, people and uh, for uh, expression. And during the construction, actually, one sees that uh, the building itself bears the memory of the place with this kind of large cantilever that sits there and that talks about the wings of the airplane that uh, used to uh, like uh, land in this earth strip. And looking further, further into that ground, um, like moving from almost a monumental approach to link to that uh, airfield to go beyond the site that was given for the competition and give to that building an urban uh, approach. Uh, the thought was how to bring also a human scale into the functions inside, how to bring back the scale of the city into the inside of the building. 
And we started thinking how to uh, like uh, give these conference spaces, the uh, like shops, the different exhibition. Again, that scale of uh, domestic scale. And then all these boxes started appearing in the plan of the building, echoing actually uh, the cityscape of uh, Tartu, but also transforming the landscape. Uh, in this posture from basically having the building disappear at some point uh, with in relation with the, like this runway, but at the same time reappearing as it moves into higher space at the entrance. And that bringing with such an extreme uh, temperature, uh, we have, as you know, uh, I think it's uh, the same temperatures that you have in Lund, like going down to minus 15 uh, in winter time and uh, other extreme in uh, summertime. And thinking about the building that uh, is consumes the least as it has its double skin, but also the skin is um, like a, uh, has a bodily relationship because it has this uh, pattern that echoes these drawings that uh, were used to knit and to create gongs. So this kind of uh, traditional uh, pattern that wear, that is worn by the building itself. Inside that museum, the spaces uh, are uh, ones that seek generosity. So basically between the volumes, one can start to see these like uh, large spaces uh, that we try to uh, defend and try to push for. Although these are not, uh, let's say, functional in the sense that they're not spaces for a very specific program like the boutique, they become spaces of engagement uh, spaces in between spaces in between the different functions that really became at the end the places where different manifestations could happen, different uh, like uh, folk uh, songs and uh, uh, gatherings. So like the generosity of space becomes uh, that of uh, uh, the actual life of the building happening between a library and between different uh, exhibitions in the building. And here moving into the exhibitions, these become places of uh, education where like the digital meets the physical and uh, like kids uh, interact and learn about uh, the their culture and uh, also about the meeting point with other cultures in these spaces. So an architecture that brings life, that sits uh, in presence in its context, but also is able in a way to talk about absence and that celebrates uh, history uh, and retransforms it into a place for appropriation. And this is a photo actually that echoes one of the diagrams that we made in the beginning as we see all the airfield invaded by people for a concert uh, for Metallica here. So what's interesting like in the process of designing is to see how the building gets appropriated actually uh, in an unexpected uh, way by artists and uh, cinema producers. And here we can see one uh, movie that was produced inside the canopy actually of the building as you see this daily knitting in the space. This is a movie uh, named Above, uh, like a short actually movie that was produced. And I really love the way the spaces are appropriated and um, and we uh, like imagine through, uh, through the imagination of our, uh, artists. And talking about how this building got uh, basically um, lived by the Estonians, we were trying, I was trying actually to talk with the people who are using that building, seeing how do they, how do they feel about it and how, what, what role actually architecture can play for them and how it somehow get, brings back hopes and at the same time, maybe uh, like, uh, 
makes them think about the fears that they had uh, in their past. Moving from there, I would like to talk about a uh, like competition that we did uh, in uh, Ukraine, in Kiev. Uh, this is in solidarity also with uh, some of the like uh, sad events happening at the moment uh, uh, in that uh, city and in that country. And uh, echoing a moment of revolution that had happened in 2014 in Maiden Square, where the Ukrainians had uh, taken over the square, manifesting against uh, uh, like a refusal to uh, write a, like a, sign an agreement with the European Union uh, by the uh, government at that time, and uh, where some people had died because of the. Uh, like uh, unleashed violence that had happened at that moment. So this uh, this talks about also architecture that talks about remembrance and uh, the will or the desire of uh, uh, Ukraine at that moment to build a museum for the revolution of uh, dignity um, and to commemorate that moment of uh, manifestation that had happened. And uh, that building really uh, continues the main square and culminates in uh, topography that talks about the landscape also of uh, Ukraine and it's kind of different uh, uh, topographies that, uh, that are there. And that also proposes a building that becomes a continuity of the street itself, uh, that becomes a public platform before being a museum. Uh, like an observatoire to the city itself uh, that culminates vertically, that brings nature also upwards uh, into the city and allows spaces for encounter relating to the notion and to the fabric of the city itself. So it's like this kind of uh, superposition of different planes that open up to the public and within, of course, uh, the exhibition spaces be become these generous spaces where uh, the like objects of the uh, revolution and uh, of, um, of that manifestation could be contained. And then here we produce this model to talk about this kind of uh, like uh, complexity of these forms that start to uh, like continue the streetscape and uh, emerge on on the heights of uh, of the city. Like moving from such contexts, which talk about sometimes uh, war, like uh, struggles, and what role architecture could play in relation to history, but also in uh, like. Uh, re, uh, re questioning the memory and re offering new spaces. One also has to think about uh, relation with the climate and more closely through that project uh, in Paris that we won uh, a few years back and that we're trying to lead to construction. Uh, it was a like a building that is a, a response to the call for innovative projects of the city of Paris. Uh, and innovative projects in the sense that they would respond to the problems that we are facing today with climate change, waste uh, of uh, food waste that is uh, that we don't see actually every day. And uh, that uh, actually can instigate change in the way we relate to our environment. Almost uh, here I'm echoing some of the books that uh, I think are interesting in that matter, like maybe trying in a way uh, be active and try to strive to end the, the Anthropocene in a certain manner. And this building sits on the edge of uh, the uh, small belt actually that, um, that was an old railway station that uh, cuts through Paris. And it's really like close to the highway that circles around the city. And it's on a site uh, next to the old railway station, but uh, that also actually there was no program uh, that was imposed by the city to, to that project. So we had really to think about the program and thinking this relationship with this old railway station that became like a place of biodiversity and also of 
like our relationship with Earth, we thought to start to develop a project around feeding and sustainable feeding. So the question is, how do you eat in a more sustainable way? How do you become more conscious about your environment through thinking about eating differently in the sense that uh, in relation to the seasons, uh, through a circular economy, never wasting, like thinking about a place where we talk about research, about innovation, about sharing, about reusing, cultivating, and uh, being cultural, like having our knowledge around uh, feeding, but also around sustainable economies. And also thinking about the program where it's a mixed use program, but all, where all the different uh, like programs are interrelating to one another. So basically, it's a place where you would um, like plant, but also a crop, live in that place, transform, uh, have a like um, a place for uh, like a canteen, but so so all even the program is set on this kind of circular relationship, but interrelation as well between the different levels. So it's not about like uh, independent stacking of floors, but really instigating constantly spatial relationships, and hence programmatic ones, human ones that talk about encounters, sometimes moments of serendipity, moments where uh, these uh, like realms are not especially functional and we don't impose a program, but they are spaces that uh, offer maybe meeting points and uh, like uh, activities that an architect would not have previewed. This is a wood construction also tower. Uh, as we may know, like wood uh, is stocks carbon. So when it's used from locally sourced materials, it is a sustainable material, but it's also inviting us to think about the buildings through assembly, like, uh, but also through this assembly. So maybe at some point uh, the material will be reused if that building will be dismantled. And we're starting to think about all the cycle of food where nothing is wasted, the, the organic material is used again in the agriculture of that building. So opening up like multiple stories within uh, the same uh, construction uh, and trying to narrate these, whether through books, through uh, the way we imagine that building, but also through models and uh, thinking about how to construct actually that building and and here again imagining like imagining this kind of uh, rooftop that becomes uh, dedicated for uh, planting and urban agriculture and then a place where one lives uh, within with small apartments within that uh, small micro ecosystem and at some level where the building relates to the neighborhood becomes a place where people just uh, enjoy their time and there's there are markets and uh, non-waste uh, like initiatives uh, that uh, that will be developed. From there I moved to Stone Garden and here again in the city of Beirut. Uh, and we live uh, in that uh, context of instability and thinking about how can architecture talk about and react to that instability, resist uh, also that city that had been either living earthquakes or uh, unfortunately many uh, like uh, wars or like extreme events like this explosion that happened just in the port area close by. Uh, and also a city that uh, beyond the violence, uh, physical violence that ha it had been living, uh, it had also been living this kind of erasure uh, of its own uh, history through the disappearance of these small houses that talk about the uh, Ottoman period, that's uh, one of the periods that had been uh, lived in uh, the city of Beirut. Uh, and that lives this kind of rapid urbanization that uh, the world had been subject to, where we can see these small uh, little houses uh, being um, overtaken by these towers that just uh, come pop up, but that also are permitted because of the urban uh, exploitation factor in the city. 
So emerging out of this kind of uh, like a long history of uh, the city of Beirut that was had lived uh, in 2000, since 2500 BC, uh, the uh, Ottoman times, uh, like, sorry, for, for that time was the Phoenician times and then the classical times with the Hellenistic Roman times and then medieval times and again uh, the colonial Ottoman rule and then the French mandate and under the like uh, constitution of uh, Lebanon. It also talks about this kind of blurring of uh, boundary. So what is actually the boundary of a nation state? Uh, where do we draw the line of uh, one land to the other? And uh, whether we're not really living a continuum uh, of history, but somehow also a kind of uh, circularity of time uh, where every time we uh, dig down, we kind of unveil again uh, the history. We see how the act of making, uh, echoing here a book by Tim Ingold, uh, the uh, English anthropologist, like uh, where I, almost like archaeology, anthropology, art and architecture are all intertwined. Uh, to make us uh, or build for us a better knowledge of our environment. So we're here like uh, in this uh, site that is very close to the city center that was destroyed after the war and that was completely rebuilt uh, in you sometimes destroying some buildings that are historical and rebuilding them identically. And this kind of very close proximity to the uh, heart of the city that was destroyed after war talks about the memory of, or like makes me question the memory of uh, the city or how do we rebuild after war how do we deal with actually uh, what like um, our relationship with history and through the built environment and why is it important actually to talk about traces of war but also uh, to uh, talk about what had happened is it part of our learning process uh, uh, to undo or stop redoing uh, the errors of the past looking also at these photos that uh, photographer for other Puri who is one of the owners actually of the land that uh, we uh, built this project on. Uh, he took these photos of Beirut under after the uh, war, along with other photographers like um, Gabriel Basilico, and they wandered around the city center. And taking the, the photos of this kind of uh, crippled landscape, but also of we can see how people after that uh, moment uh, become very identical to uh, the the buildscape and the landscape around them. They become frail and uh, and we are actually part of our environment in that sense. And these photos make me think again about archaeology and what I always try to develop in the office like this notion of archaeology of the future or architecture as an act of digging of searching of uh, making of learning through making actually and linking back to materiality learning from what exists in a place and the, the meaning for example of uh, certain uh, acts like opening what how does an opening perform itself in the city of beirut uh, through its history so that building actually emerges in relationship very much of its context, like uh, really uh, in a way making the lines of this urban law visible through the volumetry of that building. And then when opening uh, and uh, starting to frame the windows, starting to look at how the uh, opening can become um, almost like a, a tool to read the city differently, to also frame it uh, in a particular way that is not just a viewing point, but it's a critique also to the city. It tells uh, the story of this uh, urban fabric that is very much eclectic, that is uh, had, talks about its history also through different op like sizes of openings, questioning this relationship that we have with the trace of the city itself. And the moments of construction start to embody 
uh, moments of the city itself, uh, like this kind of constant destruction and reconstruction that happens, where we see the traces of what had existed on the fabric of the of the buildings. Uh, and these construction moments also uh, become places uh, or moments of appropriations by the artisans and the constructors, where they may put their own landscape, where the metal worker has his own studio inside this uh, building. So nature plays also a role in uh, the fabric of Beirut. It exists in its organicity and it's untamed. And in that moment, like in that manner, actually, the idea was for me to bring the same way that the city, like the nature exists in the city in this kind of organic manner and think of scales of nature within that building where we have this kind of large windows uh, that uh, encompass different scales of uh, plantation. So whether like these large uh, trees or smaller uh, planting plot, pots that become part of the windows and uh, that frame the view of the inhabitants into the city. Uh, so creating moments of relationship between uh, like uh, the, the city as an art form, like this window that we see looking into the outside that looks like a painting that is uh, just uh, hanging in an apartment, but also this relationship to the outside through uh, these planters. So the building is a like a private, uh, like of course a high set of standard of housing, but the question for me as an architect was how to build a tower actually that becomes more uh, anchored in its context, maybe echoes vernacular forms, learns from how, uh, like, uh, can we build uh, in um, like a more close to an environment way, especially with the uh, like Mediterranean climate where we cannot just uh, give rise to glass skyscrapers in that uh, context. Uh, and uh, that, uh, in a way, talks about the hand through the way the whole uh, finish of the facade uh, is made. So this kind of relationship with earth, with the hand. Uh, and uh, the whole venture for me was to bring uh, back the work of the artisans into the finish of the facade. Uh, thinking about the whole technique that would be rendered by hand and uh, that talks about also this moment of uh, chiseling the ground and preparing it to be uh, like planted. Uh, somehow uh, thinking about the hand as uh, an important act in architecture and in bringing uh, matter and vibrant matter into uh, the built environment. And the whole process started uh, in uh, working with these uh, like tests uh, that I started making uh, with my team in the office with this kind of uh, clay and with a fork and trying to kind of get the texture. And from there, I drew this uh, chisel or maybe a comb actually, a tool uh, that uh, would be installed on the facade and uh, that would be uh, a comb actually, combing the whole envelope through that tool and starting to make uh, the uh, the building and combing it as if it's a uh, body almost. Like again, this notion of uh, a lively uh, architecture that is able to embody uh, the hand, but can transform that cannot be ca captured in one photo. It's not like uh, just an image that uh, one can just take and uh, capture the building. It's really kind of uh, morph itself into its environment. It sits with its context, talks about the urban law that cuts sometimes some forms within its uh, like uh, volumetry. Uh, talks also about the transformation of the city because this facade is bound to be covered at some point because of the uh, the buildings close by could be destroyed at some point but and also the urban law allows for these to be replaced by higher buildings 
But the fact that the building just sits very closely to its uh, like fabric also had, in a way, uh, encouraged the adjoining buildings to be renovated and uh, to be um, actually conserved. And some points also, even if uh, the project distinguishes itself from its uh, environment, because it's a new figure, it's newly built, it does in a way like talks about what's happening around through these openings, uh, inviting one into uh, like the lobby of that uh, building with this kind of room uh, feeling of uh, lighting. It encompasses on the ground uh, this uh, like uh, gallery for uh, photography and uh, art. It's a like nonprofit organization, uh, and it's a platform for debate about uh, image in the Middle East. It's a kind of a raw space that uh, is open for different uh, manifestations to happen. And after the explosion uh, that uh, happened in August uh, 2020, uh, with that project actually sitting very closely to the silo, got in a way protected from the silo that exists, that is there, but also had resisted by itself, uh, like the envelope was had stayed intact uh, in the way that it's not uh, composed of different materials that are uh, like mechanically fixed, it's just really anchored in the ground. Nature has outlived that event, uh, but all the uh, glass was completely shattered actually, and the inside was uh, hollowed up. But somehow, maybe it resistedly like sat, uh, sat in its context, as we see here some of the photos of uh, Lorian Genitiu after the uh, blast. Um, and uh, it's still like uh, kind of sitting uh, there with the nature that is um, in place. This is a photo that I really uh, like, kind of is intriguing, intriguing, but because we can see how almost it's, it's like a photo in the 80s with these old cars and uh, like um, very uh, destroyed buildings, but so the building like collaged almost in this context. The last project that I will uh, present uh, is uh, again moving into uh, more closely actually calculating our uh, impact on the environment and building uh, this uh, low carbon passive building and uh, passive actually manufacture for uh, leather maker. Uh, and actually here it's, it's an interesting learning process because we went very uh, more deeply into technically understanding how to build a passive building, how to measure uh, more uh, in a quantifiable manner our impact on the environment. And also echoing uh, the work of the hand, uh, the relationship with making and making uh, like more specifically here, leather work and this kind of micro scalar, uh, micro gain, grain uh, relationship with the material, with the uh, imprint of the hand, with the relationship with time, because it's a place of uh, like making with, where there are a sense of acts and repetitive acts. And thinking about the building as a tool, um, as a like tool that can grow, that can uh, uh, be uh, like um, a system actually that could be grow on uh, uh, in the future. So thinking about the building that is a compact grid that maybe if uh, at some point this manufacturer wants to be uh, bigger, it could get bigger without the architecture being impacted. Uh, and uh, also talking about the uh, like context in Normandy, so we are in north of France uh, with a very kind of uh, wet environment uh, that talks about the life of that uh, milieu, of that um, like nature, trying to sustain it. So first, like to aim into a passive building, the question was how to be the most compact 
uh, of course, on a function that has to be on one ground, like very uh, compact uh, building that is positioned very closely to natural resources, things that we used to do and uh, probably uh, in the city forgot how to, to do that uh, again. And uh, just taking advantage of the natural ventilation of this position of the just north south and trying to to see how through the more kind of close relationship of setting the functions in relation to an environment we can get to the close closely to the comfort zone of, uh, um, of humans so basically uh, reducing the need of climatizing that uh, building through uh, architecturally relating to the environment first uh, and then again from there, uh, calculating closely what are the needs actually in terms of uh, electricity and energy to supply to for the uh, production and the manufacture inside that building. And then trying to uh, go and opt for more clean energies, uh, more like geothermal, photovoltaics. Of course, we we'll never like 100% uh, clean energy is always better choice than uh, going with uh, gas and uh, other modes of production and also trying to calculate how much we reduce our impact carbon footprint actually by using these other types of uh, uh, of um, energy production but also even in the way we choose the material uh, like locally uh, sourcing the material looking at what is produced close by, like we discovered that there is a brick making, because the ground, also the earth of the of that place, uh, is uh, very much uh, like um, adapted to making bricks and crafting these. Actually, calculating what would be is it less impactful to use bricks than uh, using uh, concrete and. And of course, it ended up uh, more more virtuous to use the bricks and maybe combining these with the wooden structure, and then calculating again every uh, material we use in terms of its carbon footprint and trying to find alternative materials every time that are more virtuous and more um, uh, positive uh, have. have better impact on the environment. And from there, like uh, reducing our uh, GIS, uh, GIS um, impact. So in relation to uh, like regular building, trying to bit by bit reduce the energy and uh, reaching a, a project that could be autonomous in its own energy production, but that could also be uh, renewable in its energies. But it's also kind of, it becomes a joy, it's a technical venture, but it's also almost a vernacular way of going back to uh, the hand and uh, to reviving uh, an industry of uh, artisanal bricks, talking with the uh, brick manufacturer and thinking about how these ovens function and uh, relating to the um, to this resource uh, like, the, uh, like Earth. Uh, and then manufacturing these 500,000 bricks, uh, like using their colors as part of the uh, making of that building. But also with the brick, we're going back uh, to the scale of the hand. The, when we build with brick, the natural span actually of um, structure is an arch. So we're here like again with this kind of arching uh, structures that we calculated in terms of their uh, like uh, structure. But also like magically it echoes again uh, the like the salary because we were like the manufacturer is also doing this like uh, salary where um, and the gallops of the horse with this kind of movement uh, that we can see in the arches. So through the research, in a way, the different uh, memories and uh, like elements of, of the building start to be part of their its architecture. This is a model that was exhibited in Copenhagen recently. And the building under construction, we can see these uh, arches that span in the uh, inside, uh, but also like 
the combination between wood construction and brick. And the kind of going to the scale of the hand and the, the making of, uh, of the architecture of that building. I think I reached my uh, last slide as um, I'm out of time. So thank you so much for listening. And I hope you stood with me, even if I'm online. Thank you very much, Lina, for giving us this very, very interesting insight into the situational backdrops as well as the design processes behind your works. And we look forward to having you back in like 45 minutes or so in the panel discussion. So we now turn to our second speaker, who is uh, Sandy Hilal. Uh, Palestinian of Palestinian origin and having studied and worked also in Italy and lately in Sweden in particular, but also in other places in the world. Sandy Hilal's practice is devoted to how architecture ties to the people of a place and especially populations that are marked by the consequences of colonization, of long-term conflicts and of life dependency on other peoples or other cultures' rules, uh, including refugee camps or states of land grabbing. Here, she and her long-standing practice named DAR, short for Decolonizing Architecture Art Residency, run together with uh, Alessandro Petti, has worked to find both ways of exposing and concretely dealing with the architectural possibilities, spatial reinventions, if you like, that temporarily or more permanently may offer room for life in precarious situations. Hilal was also the head of the infrastructure and camp improvement program in the West Bank at Uni United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees in the Near East from 2008 to 2014. Sandy Hilal does works in an artistic mode. Also, that includes close collaboration with participating local people or communities, not least to show how the rules concerning what we normally label space or architecture, especially public space, but also the label heritage, also in the literal term that UNESCO lose, use the term world heritage. So by that, I leave the word to you, Sandy. Thank you uh, very much, first of all, for the wonderful introduction, because I really uh, loved it very much. And I normally um, actually decide always not to prepare uh, previously my uh, lecture, but to interact with what happens. I know that I want to speak about one project, but in that sense also to um, share my emotions in, in uh, this moment. And I, I do uh, believe that um, my practice in that sense, is is um, has a sort of uh, a, um, um, nature of resistance. In in that sense, I I do believe that the fact that maybe I was born and raised in Palestine created in me a sense of uh, constant living in a situation of injustice uh, and inequality. That a little bit bring me into a moment where I used all the tools I have in my hands to understand how can we really you know, em employ architecture, art, whatever do we have in, in, in our hands to achieve a little bit of a more justice world. And I do believe, you know, I am not naive to think that it is possible, but I do believe that in order for me to still be an optimistic person, to still my, be able to live my daily life, I do need to act, right? And, and for me, architecture has been always an amazing platform to be able in, indeed to act, not only in frustration matter, because I, I 
do acted in Palestine throwing stones against my occupier. I do acted through revolutions. But I do believe also that if we understand architecture as a place, and, and indeed I do not want only to speak archi about architecture, I, I would say that architecture is part of a, a larger place where I do uh, act, like art, and, and mainly maybe public art is, is becoming a, a very important domain where it's possible to be disobedient and resistant in a proactive manner, not only by reacting to certain injustice, not only by reacting to our occupiers, not only by reacting to our colonizers, permitting them to set for us the agenda, rather than how can we employ whatever we have and whatever we can do in this particular moment to create a minimum of sense of justice for ourselves and the world, the people we work for. And therefore, definitely, I mean, for me, architecture does not mean material evidence. The material evidence are the same employed in order to resist. And I would like really to insist in resistance because I do understand architecture as also um, a, a set of a dominant structures and of structures that are invisible. And, and you know, we use the word architecture in so many uh, um, terms, but though I, I still feel a little bit the frustration, especially when I was a student of architecture, that I have to depart from thinking the materials. This is one way, and it is an amazing one way of thinking architecture, but for me, thinking architecture departure always from why and who are the people with whom I am working and why do I uh, do this? And of course, it's not easy because I understand, you know, many of you say, yeah, but I follow my client. And this is maybe another point in our projects where we do not necessarily follow our clients. And indeed, we decided actually always to work in small scales architecture. So what you will see always from our practice is always, you know, people speak about scale up. And, and we always in, insist on scaling down as a way to be able to interact within our condition of interactions, right? So in, in that sense, I guess it's, um, it, architecture has been always, uh, for me, a way of, of, first of all, understand better my own situation and my own life and create a platform through which I could resist together with other people. And indeed, uh, you know, my move to Sweden has been quite inspiring and almost shift the practice into other levels because living in Palestine, I always understood and worked within a condition of statelessness. And the condition of statelessness is, is always imposed on you. What does it mean, first of all, to make collective spaces in the absence of a state, right? So in, in that sense, how people gather, who are the manager of any place, who is the one cleaning the place at the end, opening the place at the beginning. And it felt to me while living in Palestine, it was extremely almost normal that it is, it's the people that are doing all this. It's in, in the absence of a state. And then I arrived to Sweden and for my luck and for many maybe good coincidences, I lived in the extreme, in, maybe in the country in the world where statelessness has lasted for so many years, like Palestine, and in Sweden where it's surprisingly the relation between the individual and the state has been, you know, I knew a little bit about it. It is not that it was, but when I lived here, I felt, oh my goodness, I mean, there is something very strong here about that relation between individual, the individual and the state. But in the middle, there are a lot of things that happens like neighboring, hosting, uh, you know, certain practices that are normally very strong used by societies that in somehow were a little bit left behind by this whole building of a modern welfare state. And then the public space has been intended as the public space managed by the state, right? And, and there has been almost no gray zone between what is public and what is private. It, it's 
I mean, I think that it, it really took seriously the whole modern building of a state to a point that the separation between the private and the public in, in a place like Sweden has been almost, for me, a, I, I felt it physically, right? Especially working for so long period in refugee camps, where absolutely there is no way that one can define what is public and what is private because they are extremely blurred. I mean, people build their own houses and they are not the owners of these houses and there is no municipality that uh, um, sort of manage the public space. And, and therefore, coming from after 10 years of working in refugee camps where there is no way to define public to and private, I arrived to Sweden where the public and the private are highly codified. I mean, to the point that it's so hard to resist them. You know, there is so heavy um, uh, codification of the public space. And of course, I, I feel that this has been the real challenge for whoever comes in Sweden that has not been trained since he or she born to follow and to behave within that codified public, right? So, and, and in that sense, if you will arrive at a certain age, and, and there is also a, a taken by granted, I guess, in, in such a public that you should know, right? But I, I mean, I am a, a, I say I am a PhD holder. I studied all my life. I am, I love learning, but it has been so hard for me to accept and to learn this, this whole codified public space because I always feel that there is a sort of um, paternalism to say the least, right? I mean, this is the way you should behave and that's it. But this brings society into a way that interaction and transforming of societies. And then on the other hand, of course, we say we would like to understand our societies at a multicultural society, pluricultural society, while our public space should stand with its codes and we should defend it and we should, whoever is here should behave and should behave as a perfect guest, right? So I cannot understand how, how we can achieve a pluricultural public space the moment we say this is the only public space that you should behave in and we are the one integrated you and including who is including whom become a very important question and who is the host and who is the guest become extremely important because people are extremely left to become eternal guests and of course it's it's extremely nice to be uh, guest, but you know, in many cultures, among them also the Swedish culture, the Arab culture, we say, uh, you know, you are a guest for three days, and the fourth day is either you stink, you smell. But in Arabic, and especially in Islam, I really love it because they say you become a sadaqa, and the sadaqa is the Islamic tax for helping the ones that are in the need of help and me means that you become a charity member of society. So indeed, my question through this project was, I accept to be a guest for three days in Sweden, but who I am the fourth day and how do I act? What does that mean? And how I understand a public that is able to bring me to become a political agent able to participate also because the problem in there the moment we keep people guests forever we don't take the maximum of what we can they, they cannot give their highest potential and the society would not take out of them the best that they can give right so and 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 you know holding also a position of a host it's extremely heavy and hard. You know, imagine that you become host that is on public level, right? The fact that the government is always the host. Imagine you have to host forever, right? There is this, of course, hosting is power, but indeed it is power and it can become way more power if we understand that guesting and hostings are acts where we move constantly. Also because imagine the fact that not being able to be a guest means that you never ever let yourself learn from others. You know, you never ever let the others lead you, lose a little bit of control, learn better about other smells, other cultures, without having a very defined position of power. So indeed this project, and I decided to speak about only one project and go very deeply in it, because I, I do believe that, you know, for each project, 
it has been a different story, and each time I tell story, I, I like to be able to uh, tell it deeply. So what I will leave you now uh, with this project called The Living Room in Boden, uh, that has been uh, actually the, the first project I did in Sweden as soon as I arrived, and it was maybe a reaction and the resistance to a body feeling whenever I was in the public space. I felt that I was observed, I felt I had to behave, and I did not have the skills enough to behave, and I wished to be able to create a multiplicity of uh, public spaces and of collective spaces. And this project you will see now, I will leave you with 18 minutes of, of a long uh, narration of that project, is an attempt to understand is it possible to think our public space as a multiplicity of public spaces and different kind of collectivities rather than understanding the public space as one only uh, centralized public space managed by the governments and the municipalities. So if we can please uh, send the video on and then I will conclude. Oh my God, I don't even have time to conclude. The only story that is told about Boden is its military uh, story. The place that meant to protect the northern border of uh, Sweden from a potential war that would come from Russia. Wow, what a place. It was the place where soldiers used to live, waiting a war from Russia to arrive. The arrival of refugees in Boden is part of this war that they were waiting for. بتذكر أول ما طلعنا بالباصات وصلنا لهون عند بودن فأحد الأشخاص قالوا إنه السويد بعثتنا لعند الدببة ما في أشخاص هون نهائيا بس دببة فأنه أنا هيك تفكر يعني صفنت إنه معقول إنه هو بس غابات ودببة إنه كان رح يكون نص الغابات The yellow house is that building in the middle of nowhere in Boden and it used to be for a long time the most discriminated social housing for even the people in uh, Boden and that as a consequence it was termed to be uh, the place where refugees were uh, sent to live. You get inside these rooms, very small one, very closed one because of the winter, because of the cold and there is a feeling that they live completely alone in that place that where they belong nowhere and uh, they sort of have no social life and they seem to be waiting for that moment that they will leave that place. And, you know, I, I feel that the depression comes out of the fact that they had a dream of arriving to Sweden and by arriving to Boden they were shocked that this was not the dream they were looking for. I was desperate. I thought that there is nothing that can be done there. I mean, from one side a war that never arrived and from the other refugees depressed and looking for the day they will leave Boden. What type of project can be ever done there? I wake up in the morning after and I decided to come back to the Yellow House 
and ask people if they know about anyone among refugees that is planning to stay in Boden. To my surprise, they told me, yeah, yeah, you should meet Yasmin and Ibrahim. <laughs> هاي القهوه السوريه طبت انا بدي أنا بدي أدفع هنا لا ما ليش أي الله وها وهات كمان الله يسعدك احسب فنتين لا 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 ما خلص لا هو ولا أنت لا 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 وحياتك الهدية هيك صعبة إبراهيم احكي شيء نطلع مش دافعين تسلم شكرا when somebody arrives to a new place, he's obviously a guest. I have no problem to be a guest, and I have no problem even to be a perfect guest, but I still want to exercise my right to host. And I think that what refugees lose the moment they cross the borders to Europe is their right to host. لما وصلنا لهون على السويد مثل ما خبرتك قبل كان كتير صعب انه تدخلي بالمجتمع السويدي ونتعرف على اشخاص سويديين او انه مجرد انك تعرفيهم عن حالك وانه انتم انه احنا من سوريا فكان شعور انه حتى لما بقول لك اه سوري انه احنا اسفين انه هيك صار فيكم كان شعور ممكن انه يزعجنا يعني انه حتى لما واحد يتاسف على الشيء اللي صار شيء بيزعجك يعني ايه فمن هون انه بلشنا انه مثلا شفنا اي شخص انه تعا جرب اكلنا السوري فينا نحكي لك شوي عن سوريا فيك تعرف عنا شوي وهيك بلشنا من هالموضوع انه نفتح غرفة المعيشة تبعتنا او الليفينج روم المظافة بالنسبة لمجتمعنا العربي والسوري بشكل خاص وإذا فينا نقول محافظتنا نحن بشكل خاص الرقة لها تاريخ قديم جدا أتذكر أول لما كان يحكي لنا أنه والدي مثلا أو أنه أجداده أنه كان باب غرفة المظافة ما بصير يتسكر أنه دائما بيكون مفتوح للضيف وكان الضيف يجي ثلاثة أيام على البيت وأنت ما تسأله حتى أنه ليش شو جاي يعني ثلاثة أيام بالضيفة وبعدها ممكن إذا بدك تسأله أنه أنت ليش جاي كان هذا المجتمع مثل مرجع يعتبر أو مثل مكان إنه أوكي خلينا نروح لهذا المكان خلينا نروح لهاي المضافة نروح تجي الناس طبعا اللي عندهم مشاكل يحكوا في مشاكلهم بالأخص أيام الربيع العربي فصارت المضافة مكان التقاء الآراء كلها المؤيد مع المعارض كلهم يجتمعوا بنفس المكان ويصيروا يحكوا ويصيروا يتناقشوا ممكن توصل لحد انه انه هذا هذا الفريق مثلا فرحا بسقوط دكتاتور بس اكلهم مؤيدين معارضين مو؟ بالضبط اي دونت ثينك اتس اتس ذا ويذر اور ذا كولد اور ذا ايزوليشن اي بيليف ذات وات ريفيوجيز ميسز ذا موست از فاينلي سمبادي ويزاوت اكسبكتينج ات coming and knocking their door. أول حدا طلبنا منه إنه يجي لعدنا فقال إنه فتح التقويم تبعه الكالندر فعطانا موعد بعد أسبوعين أو ثلاث أسابيع ما تذكر بالضبط فإنه أنا طلعت هيك عبراهيم إنه بعد ثلاث أسابيع لحتى يجي لحد لعنا وإنه يشرب فنجان قهوة فابراهيم قال خلص انه اوكي يعني نبلش من هيك فبكره كل اسبوع يصير عندنا حدا بقدر اقول انه هي 
نقلة نوعية كبيرة إنه إحنا نفتح غرفة معيشتنا. براتا مهنة. ابنك رح يعيش بهالمجتمع كيف إنه أنت رح تربي هالطفل بمجتمع جديد مثلاً كل شيء فيه جديد. يعني ما بقدر ربي مثلا كيف انا ربيت بسوريا ولا اقدر ربي مثلا كيف السويدين عم يتربوا هلا بس فيني اخذ مثلا من اثنين خلصنا شويه بندوره يا دكان انت سو يس 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 اي This living room managed to shift the whole dynamics of guests and hosts. Yasmin and Brahim are not anymore the guests in Sweden. They actually, by opening their living room, they managed to regain back their agency. We had Mona Fina dance orchestra in Sweden. So they were so in Sweden. Oh, 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 oh. دي دي إلى بحر هند يبودا. Soon. <laughs> Is integration only about denying a previous culture that you brought with you? Or it is about bringing the old and the new life together? And at the sudden, in that tiny living room, I feel that Ibrahim and Yasmin was able to bring their past, their present, and their future all together. Yeah. Hey, Do. Hey, Do. The living room project is very much about how to deal with the role of the domestic space within a framework of statelessness. Indeed, when I say statelessness, I don't mean that are only people that are without state legally, but statelessness means people that indeed feel not represented by the state or are not represented in that moment by the state or legally stateless. And in a sense, the, the way they disassociate themselves from the public space or that they do not belong to the public space or that they have hard time accessing public space, the role of the domestic becomes very important for them. And indeed, the Living Room Project is one of these projects that is very much dealing with, if I am stateless, what does it mean for me to be still in collectivity, to create common places, to create places from where I still believe that I belong, I can speak, I can express my perspective, I can express my being, and I can be proud of who I am. During the process of the project, we were given a ground floor in the Yellow House. And in this ground floor, we tried to turn it into a semi-square. Indeed, the only architectural intervention that have been done here is to throw all possible walls and to open up to the uh, outside and is one of the corners of the uh, building becoming simply transparent and, and can open itself on both sides and in good days it becomes a completely open corridors to the outside and in the cold times it becomes a square through which 
you see the light and you see people sitting and it becomes almost a light box of square that people are able to see from outside and indeed interact or come yeah. in. And it has been working in an amazing way by having Yasmin proposing herself as a host. Yasmin began to come to the living room and began to activate it. And with time, they created what they called the Saturday's rituals. There is a lot of co-hosting or, or offering each other the ability of being hosts because they understand that hosting is power, hosting is visibility, and they are all into this situation where they are kept guests forever as migrants. And I think that they understood that by practicing the right of hosting, it's a way of claiming agency of becoming visible in the city. Now, I can be the first or second time, I remember I was the one who وأنا تعمدت إنه تكون من بلدان مختلفة يعني كل أسبوع بلد مختلف يعني لكل واحد يظهر إيش في عنده مثلا وبنفس الوقت حتى لو كان مثلا من نفس البلد إنه أشخاص مختلفين كل واحد يظهر بيئته بشكل مختلف حتى فهي أول مرة وثاني مرة أنا اللي اخترت ممكن بس بعد هيك لا الأشخاص هم صاروا يجوا لعندي أو يكتبوا لي أو شيء إنه فينا إحنا نطبخ الأسبوع الجاي حابين نطبخ كذا حابين نكون يعني متواجدين بنشارك مثلا هم يعني هم بيحسوا انه هاد يوم هم يعني فبدهم يظهروا باحسن ما يكون بغض النظر ان كانوا متواجدين سويديين او مش سويديين الموجودين يعني بس انه كل شخص بيحس حاله انه خلص انه هاد يومي يعني ولا بعزم حدا بقول انه مين بده يطبخ المره الجايه وخلص فهو بيتكفل حتى باليوم بيخبر او هاي احيانا انه ايه اذا شفت حدا جديد او هاي بخبر عن المشروع انه نحن هناك فيكم تتفضلوا تواجدوا بس الاشخاص اللي متواجدين وبيعرفوا لا خلص حتى في بعضهم انه صار يوم السبت ما بيرتبط بولا شيء يعني في عندنا يلو هاوس في عندنا وظافه لازم نروح ايه فهيك وحتى في رجال انه صارت تشجع المشروع مو بس نسائي يعني في رجال كثير صاروا يطلبوا انه هم يطبخوا انه هم يكونوا يشاركوا في رجال طبخوا يعني ايه فحسيت انه صار الكل يعني انه بده يطبخ بده يشارك بده يكون موجود يعني أو كمان مرتين ثلاثة خلينا كمان إنه فينا نقول مراهقين أو أطفال كمان يطبخوا طبعا بإشراف والدتهم يعني بس طبخوا واحد منهم بتذكر كان عمره يمكن 12 أو 13 سنة عمل لنا شاورما يعني فكان هيك حسيت إنه الكل يعني متشجع إنه أنا بدي يكون ليش لا أنا كمان فيني أعمل شيء فأنا يومها تفاجأت لما هو طلب مني إنه فيني أطبخ قلت له إيه ما في مشكلة فعد هو من أول وجديد يعني من, من الصفر بلش وقطع الجاج واشتغل فيه من البداية للنهاية وحسيت يعني قبل بيوم إنه ستريس إنه تاني يوم ما بيلحق معلش أفرم قبل بيوم الجاج وهاي <تصفيق> فهيك حسيتهم يعني إنه بدهم يكونوا جزء And indeed I have to say that in three years time they absolutely managed to put the living room in the map, in the institutional map of the city. And, and, and you see them, they are proud of it. They even began to invite politicians at a certain point to bring them in their space and to show them what they managed to create. And there was a sense of proudness of being host and of having their own place where they can invite the rest of the city. جربتوا كثير مرات تعزموا السياسيين انتوا تعزموهم للمضافة بدل ما هم يعزموكم لنشاطاتهم بتفكري اثر مين اللي عازم مين يعني اثر انه هم اجوا هون بدل ما انتوا تكونوا رحتوا عندهم على البلديه ولا على مؤسساتهم ولا يعني اختلف شيء بطريقه بالعلاقه هو ما اختلف شيء بالعلاقه بس يمكن نحن اللي كسرنا الحاجز هلا اكيد واحد لما بيكون هو المستضيف فبحس نقطة القوة مثلا عنده بايده يعني ايه فلما انت مثلا بتقعدي انت تشرحي بصير دورك مثلا كلاجة انا بدي اشرح هلا انه هي قوانيني انه انا ببلدي مثلا كنت هيك انه احنا كنا ناكل هذا 
ايه هلا بجوز انه هو ما بيعني شيء للشخص المقابلك بس هو بيعني لك لك انه انت اعطيتيه شيء او نقطه او شيء نظره عن الشيء اللي عشتيه قبل يمكن هو بيعني لك كثير مثلا ممكن يعني لي كثير انه اشرب فنجان القهوه مع هيل يعني بجوز هو عم يتذوقه لاول مره بجوز ما عجبه يعني بس بالنسبه لي يعني عم بشرح له انه فنجان القهوه مع الهيل بيعني لي كثير I mean, I think I finished my time, right? And um, and I thank you very much uh, for listening to me, and I am looking forward for uh, more discussions uh, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. And uh, perhaps we have Lena also back. Uh, I would st just start by saying that we, uh, in order for some of the afternoon guests to be able to leave uh, with their communications, we have to start the afternoon session at one. So we cannot go on with the panel too long, but we will pass 12 with, I don't know, some five or 10 minutes or something like that. And uh, I would also like already now to say to the students that are here that there are sandwiches to have during this smaller than hour lunch hour. Um, and I also invite uh, then all of you to step up here. Uh, not all of you, because Lina is on distance, uh, but Jesper, who is also the invited discussant, and Sandy, please. And uh, I think since I have a couple of questions, but uh, since we are slightly mm -hmm. short of time, maybe we should simply start with some of the questions that have ra been raised already by students, or if you raise your hand here in the room, I think that would be the best way to, to start, actually. Yes, I have a question from, um, from our digital audience. Uh, it's directed to Lena, but I think all of us, all of you could uh, jump in. <coughs> uh, while the archaeologist, in a way, searches for the narrative of physical action of a specific space, what kind of narrative can architects bring to the table in a certain space-related context? So, would you like to start, Lena? Yeah, thank you. Um, just I want to start by uh, saying how beautiful also the presentation of uh, Sandy was really kind of uh, heartwarming to see these actions and uh, and work and I think also the question is uh, somehow very relevant to what you presented Sandy. Um, I, I think like yeah I mean when we're an archaeologist we're trying to dig into uh, stories, narratives, the meaning of well, what spaces have in their context. And uh, as an architect, I have this parallel with an archaeologist and the kind of uh, uh, search for a belonging, for, uh, for a meaning of uh, how architecture can belong to a place and uh, what does it narrate actually in relationship to, to that place, to its history, to the traces that exist uh, in, a, in a certain uh, uh, context and it's not simply just like finding a uh, exogenous story or like a story that we just tell about the project but being able to say or to allow a space a building to really tell the story of a context and to perform through its physical matter the, uh, the the context itself uh, and uh, what what belongs uh, to, to that place whether the things that we craft by hand and the trace of the hand on uh, on uh, building 
uh, but also the typologies of spaces that the uh, project can develop, like uh, whether it's a housing in Beirut or um, the museum in Estonia, where it relates to uh, to that platform uh, that uh, that creates the quality of the context itself. Yes, would you like to add something? Maybe. I, yeah, you mean, definitely, I think that mainly all uh, all the work I am doing, um, I would not say that I am doing architecture mm -hmm. as much as I am challenging the narration through architecture in, in that sense. So I'm challenging certain uh, dominant power structures through architecture. So I would say that a lot of time indeed, um, for me, and, and maybe this is this can be criticized by many architects, the detail of architecture become a little bit of a less important rather than what architecture can indeed create as crack in society and, and how such a space where basically there is almost no architectural intervention is challenging the city of Boden, its politicians, its migration office, etc., etc. So I, I do believe that architecture sometimes can play a crucial role in the narrative, especially because, you know, if we think architecture has been always nearby powers, giving them the visual imaginations of what their ideology should look like, right? So I'm, I'm wondering if instead of being only nearby the power and the economy and the money, if we try to employ that same architecture into creating a counter narrative, right? So into challenging that narrative, into understanding the power exactly because politicians and, and many dictators uh, ships understood the power of architecture. I'm wondering, can we use it almost against itself or, or employ it as a counter narration and I would insist maybe as a resistance tool in societies where we see more and more equity and justice getting completely lost. Yeah, I think uh, it's an interesting question uh, to talk about archaeology as a, uh, uh, as a one form or maybe multiple forms of context, contextual uh, background to uh, also if you're uh, devoted to more mainstream design as an architect, I think that that is really valid knowledge. And in archaeology, we also have this kind of, I don't know the term in English, but a, a kind of contemporary archaeology where you study very recent traces and those traces could be material, but they could also be about narratives. It could be about situations, it could be about politics, it could be many different things. So in that term, I th um, in that sense, I think arch archaeology um, uh, holds multiple forms of contextual information that is really valid for us as architects and designers. We can learn a lot from that. I could add that uh, the notion of archaeology in itself also sort of implies that we get sight of histories that we did not know of before. Some, okay. some we did know of, some we did not know of, so to say. And I think both of your projects uh, extremely well illustrate this. Yes. Probably just to draw on that, Jasper, I think also the... the in a way, archaeology uh, teaches us also that there is a process of finding uh, and building a story. Uh, whether and sometimes this kind of a narrative is not the absolute truth. And the question that architecture does not bring an absolute truth into uh, like a context, you kind of find certain uh, like. Uh, you have findings and then you build out of them and the question like the the, pos the possibility of constantly discursively questioning what one is doing is very important uh, to encompass dialogues and open up for uh, discussion yeah. through space making yeah we should never forget our role i, I mean we are active i mean it yeah. is reactive and we are always active as architects and uh, uh, in any way we work. I mean, uh, even the way you mentioned as well, uh, that you're yeah. interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, could, I could pose one more question or subject of discussion that, that has to do with what you, I mean, 
really already have shown both of you, but uh, still when you come to a site or you're, you're, you start to be occupied with the site uh, in, in terms of uh, how people in general and how we relate to our history so, as something we also sometimes want to forget or we sometimes are forced to forget somehow. Uh, how, how do you start to work with such resistance, or what we should call it, uh, as an architect, when, when you first start to become occupied with the site. That would be very interested to know if you have any kind of strategy or tactics for that, or if you are just open and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, at least for me, the, sometimes the less I know, the better it is, because I, I go with a complete uh, sort of... Uh, it depends, of course, where is it that we are operating, because indeed when um, my first part of the practice has been in Palestine, where I had a very, very deep uh, knowledge in somehow, and, and I, I was there, and, and my way of resisting has been a completely different comparing to me coming uh, to Sweden, and also engagement in, has been a little bit uh, different. And in, indeed, the first time I went to Buden, I was not even sure I have the skills to operate there, right? Because who am I? I know nothing. Sweden is a complete different landscape comparing this was my first time to be in such harsh uh, landscape. I felt it's only harsh and then I I arrived to Buden the first day of snow and people were extremely happy it's snowing and I thought that they don't like the snow but I, I discovered and I thought you know even on basics you know people like the snow and I thought they don't like it I discovered that they like it because it's light but indeed being in Buden and, and knowing almost nothing and also putting my position in myself in a position of knowing nothing was also a way to understand can we combine cultures because I, I of course I went there but I have my backpack right the temporariness the waiting the uh, you know being alienated in a place being a refugee political agent or not so this my backpack was a way of saying you know I come to Boden I have my backpack and I would like to find the people with whom I can share that knowledge. So indeed, I was not looking for architecture. I was more looking for people with whom to initiate the project. And I have to admit that most of our projects, if not them all, was first finding to whom we have to think architecture and then eventually uh, try to understand how this architecture can be part of this. And indeed, we never left it completely. I mean, we, we don't do architecture and then we leave it. It's always, you know, I still receive uh, phone calls from people in Buden because the place has been closed by the migration office and it's still empty and they are frustrated. So, and somehow they say, why it's empty? Why? why it's even closed, right? You know, and, and, and we have no answers for this. But matter of fact, I never... Uh, these are stories that are part of, of our work and, and people part of... So I, I guess in that sense, if I have to answer, it's I never begin with a space or a location or it's always why... I mean, who are the people with whom... Uh, and I go to look for this before mm. uh, anything else. Mm. Lina, you have also worked with grounds that, that where you meet resistance. Can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, I think one um, this question raises two things. One is the the, uh, the fact of like of actually working somewhere else, like um, as a Lebanese, also working in France, uh, having moved actually to France to work there. As uh, Sandy is underlining, there is a sense of uh, newness and a sense of questioning that uh, starts that you're in a context that uh, has a dynamic and the forces of making that are completely different uh, than what you're used to. And this gives also a capacity, a critical capacity to perceive uh, the, uh, the way society is made, the way space is manufactured, the way what, what are the meanings of spaces in a certain place and instigate 
wants curiosity. And for me, it opens up many, uh, like this desire to know more, actually, to to ground what uh, what would I do, actually, and to look at uh, what what is the history of that uh, that line that I see on a landscape? Why is it there? Why people are rejecting rejecting it? What do, what are the relationship actually uh, present between uh, society and the space and how does it how a new space can actually uh, instigate a new uh, relationship by the way uh, I, I would make it so uh, this kind of uh, distant relationship is allowing this constant questioning but this kind of quest also for manufacturing new uh, ways of making and of relating which is really an interesting uh, uh, and uh, quite um, a meaningful uh, way for an architect to become also an agent in the making not only as someone who's just doing a sketch and just uh, implementing a building but more like an agent for new relationships to be built with one's history but also with one's territory with uh, between people uh, between each other so i would say it's um of course, like uh, building something is leaving out something else and one is conscious about it uh, in a way, creating a situation ha does have the consequence sometimes and creating also the problem in a different manner. But uh, as an architect trying to kind of, as a porous sponge actually, creating this kind of interrelation of the most elements possible, is also one of the quests that uh, we're constantly uh, undergoing in, in my atelier. Yes, we have more questions from um, from the or digital audience, but maybe first we should see if there's someone in the room who wishes to speak up. Okay, please come back if if so. <coughs> Um, yes, so the question is, how would you encourage a community to being hosts in a wider sense and interact with different cultures when they live in a segregated area cut off from society by physical and mental borders? And uh, I, I think this could be directed to, to, uh, to all of you. Yeah, I mean, I, I can begin to try as I was the one raising the right mm. to be a host. But in, indeed, I, I think that, first of all, this project wants to um, acknowledge that there are uh, two positions in society. And this is one of the ways that we are organizing our society. So there are different ways among them. For example, for me, in this modern society, we should absolutely bring back both hospitality and neighboring to the, to the table. That, that are two things that we really... Uh, almost left behind in, in thinking modern architecture in that sense. And, and I begin, I mean, there are different projects where I face also neighboring, but for me, hospitality is, is also about the fact that you acknowledge this. You know, I mean, the moment that people say, I, I do want to use my right to be a host, right? I do not want to be only a guest, even if you are in the most subjugated and the most segregated uh, part of the world, you still actually claim it because, you know, our political rights needs to be acknowledged first. We should see them. We should see where is it that and, and hosting for so many, um, um, you know, I mean, speaking about I, I come from the Middle East, but I think that it, it's the same for everyone. The moment that, you know, hosting is a practice that you learn from when you are a child no matter which country or which place you are coming from. And it, it, it's a knowledge, it's an inherited knowledge that you know nobody can teach you because you know it. So by, by itself to say, I can be a host, I want to exercise my right to be a host, means that you are asking to exercise your narrative. You know, this is the way where also you become visible and representatives of your own self. I mean, indeed, I, I will argue also that the fact that we decided that the living rooms are useless spaces in, in many places, you know, thinking about our grandparents' living rooms that were there, always empty, uh, very ready, very clean, very... But if you think this was the square, the plaza of our grandparents, right? It was the plaza for self-representation. It was the plaza where when they were hosting, they become visible, they become important, they become... 
agent of their own uh, ways, they become powerful. And indeed, we in this whole last 50 years, giving up completely and, and considering that the homes need to be functional, we gave up also a little bit with our right to self-represent ourselves and not only to be represented by governments and states. So I guess, you know, we should a little bit revise, for me at least, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed now to revise the role of the living room and to bring back the living room of my grandmother as her plaza that, that I today lost. So and I think this is where we can also interact with certain segregated uh, neighborhoods. And I think this is also valid outside of segregated oh, neighborhoods. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Lina? Yeah, maybe like one word that comes to mind uh, that is quite important is empathy, is uh, also how we can live with empathy in the world and uh, between each other actually as humans. And uh, I think also questioning the systems uh, that constitute the way we relate uh, to each other, but also we relate to our environment at large. Uh, like sharing, uh, the question of sharing is so important. Like we live in a in systems where we're brought to own things, own territories, own uh, uh, country, own. While actually we're just, uh, if we if I borrow the the word from Sandy, we're host actually on this earth. We're just like actually sharing that environment, and we're sharing the the uh, like the, the ground. So how do we share our uh, like? time, how do we share with others is uh, quite um, important. How do we share spaces uh, instead of uh, like acting in a possessive manner, like you don't open your door because it's your place, but is it actually your place? How much, how much do you own the, the uh, like uh, the, the physical matter around you? I think uh, in uh, Sunday's presentation, I think it was quite uh, wonderful and interesting when you talked about Sweden's way of thinking as we think of us as this is a multicultural, uh, a pluralistic society, but the public space should stay as it is, stay put. It couldn't change, but maybe there's a way of uh, uh, making a kind of spatial opportunities uh, for hosting, for everyone to host. Mm. Uh, so, it's. I think it's about maybe diversity and complexity, and to letting in. In I uh, mean, inviting hostship through uh, spatial design. Uh, I think that it's perfectly possible in any project we may be involved in. Yeah, I mean, if you echo this, uh, basically. Sorry, I'm interrupting. Like, uh, mm. like this kind of open spaces, like uh, when I'm showing, for example, the museum, if I do the project as dictated by the program, I would just have a box that is completely mm -hmm. functional. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, the challenge was how to create this in-betweenness, actually, that mm -hmm. actually become the whole sense of these spaces, mm -hmm. that become the places of sharing, of interaction. Mm -hmm. How do you give this kind of generosity back uh, to, to people, to, to the city, through space making uh, in whichever form it may take? It, it's also a way of creating those gray scales between the absolute public and private, uh, which I completely agree that we sometimes lack. And uh, there is this kind of uh, um, area where we can operate from many different uh, uh, perspectives and backgrounds and uh, intentions. Yeah, indeed, and this is, I, I fully agree that grey area is not white, is not black, right? Mm. This is grey area that, mm. you know, we can occupy mm. temporary, in a temporary manner, we can become visible and then again invisible. So I, I do believe that maybe an effort indeed, I mean, in architecture we have, we, 
we have been always seeking permanency as you know for our buildings to stay after we leave this uh, planet right but we never give enough thought to temporariness and and places where you can shift roles and when you you can challenge power structures and i think that it would not be bad to give temporariness i mean not only as a reaction to a disaster which means a smart tent or smart shelter or we do something very quickly so people can survive i mean there are people palestine show us that it, they are, there are people that live all their life as temporary people right so in that sense what is it as architects that we can do in this domain not only as a reactionary uh, we, that we do not need to react only, but maybe we can create the ground for temporariness mm. to flourish and to be a place where, you know, mm. whoever is new in a society or is not belonging becomes the space for them to mm. belong in, in their own terms and to create, I mean, the society would become way more, maybe it would become less boring and way more exciting and somehow. Mm -hmm. And probably temporariness, as you have shown already, um, is the very means by which we can have more people understand the very simple but also mind-blowing change from, if I may say so, only uh, advising or giving or offering hospitality, but supporting to become hosts as newcomers, for instance, and as everybody. That's, that's uh, very simple, but mind-blowing <laughs> change, so to say. Uh, we have one question from the audience, please. We don't have any microphones, so if you raise your question, I can repeat it. the space, who provides the money from Migrationswerke, etc. It's not enough to just say, okay, here's a gallery and now inhabit it or something like rent it out, but there needs to be kind of a constant idea or also adaption to changes, etc. So it's something which goes beyond what architects are usually thinking or what we are also paid for by clients. So I wonder, that's for sure nice because it might be a new area of occupation of architect, but it's also something where we are stepping out very clearly out of our competencies or somebody who constantly follows up on a building and how it's used, etc. I wonder like, what, what your idea is about this kind of structures, that, uh, how they could emerge and how they could also last. Before you, before you answer, Sandy, I take the liberty of, of trying to repeat your question for the sake of no, our... So, yeah, yeah, no, I, I take the liberty. <laughs> because of the mic. Because I have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all about other actors, to make it very simple. But you ask about uh, the structures behind the very architectural or designally possibilities you have to make these kind of changes or make, ha make these kind of ideas happen. And uh, as a specific, uh, specifically tied to the areas of occupation that we have heard here. So maybe, Sandy, you yeah, could develop. Yeah, I this. would absolutely try to uh, answer this question. You know, I, I mean, I want to come back to how I understood that there is difference between what is public and what is the concept in Arabic called masha. Or in, in the Arab world, there has been a, a different kinds of um, collective ownership, right? Not only a state ownership, but many of them. And you have the state ownership, but you have what we call masha, and the masha was simply uh, that land around each village where villagers would not go alone to um, uh, activate it and to plant it. But each year they were have a shortage, each one of them would have one of piece of this land and they activate it. And, and this land is yours as long as you're still activating it. What is the difference between the masha and the public? That the public can exist without people because it's managed by the state. 
the mashah cannot be, cannot exist by people because there is no state to manage it. So it should be managed by the state, right? So I'm a little bit here trying to distinguish between a collectivity that is managed by the state and the collectivity that is not managed by the state. And therefore, our role as architects would become completely different because if we are asked to design a museum, we know that this museum would be run by the state or the, there is already a man. I mean, it's not true that there are nobody to take care of, but the state or institutions or um, or you are, if you are asked to, to design a square, you know that the municipality of that city would be taken care of. What I'm pointing out, is there a way to think about other kinds of collectivities that are not necessarily managed by the state? And if you do so, absolutely you need a different mechanism because then suddenly there is a huge difference between the municipality being invited in the living room, run and hosted by refugees, or if refugees are going to talk in the municipality. The dynamic is completely different because they are in the municipality and they would not say the same thing. I tell you, I mean, the way the discussion goes is completely different because in one side, politicians are sitting in a place on the ground. They are not used to sit on the ground. They are eating a food that is alien to them. They are hearing a language that is alien to them and they become humble enough to be not the teachers, but to hear their hosts, right? When the same people are going to the municipality, they are there to behave and to act. And, and I'm not saying one is, of course, I'm not saying that we should all be stateless, but I say a, a, a place becomes way more democratic and way more pluriculture if we will permit other people to become actors. And I tell you, it is not, we are not losing anything. Our society would become way more rich and interesting. There is one more question from the audience. I think it will be the last one from the audience, judging from time. Yeah. No, I, I, I do agree, but here I would ask, are we coming back to a, a situation where we built the place and then we, it needs to be filled by people or it is the other way around? I mean, this, this living room in Boden would not have been the case if there were no people that were willing to host in, in that sense. So either there are already an attempt to say, yes, I mean, let's see who, but again, I, I, I do believe that maybe these are two different approaches and two different, very important approaches that can maybe uh, sort of influence each other, right? So one can get influence from the other and, and the other way around in which maybe we agree on the fact that maybe we, we need to create spaces exactly that that are more at the intersection between the private and the public where people feel that they are not completely in an abstract uh, uh, public space that is managed by others and i also would like you to think for example you know occupying um, 
uh, Wall Street in, in New York, where it happened in a place they were pe when people are protesting against states, suddenly what we consider our own public space is not anymore ours because we are not permitted to protest there. If we don't like our own states, we are these places are not ours. These places are to most of the time to oppress us. So at the end, when we want to really protest, we go in New York and find a place that is owned privately, but have a public sort of uh, dimension so we can protest. So it is also to problematize a little bit this, uh, you know, we, we public is not necessarily always, is, for example, Israel, one thing that they did, they came to Palestine, put the map, and any any form of collectivity, Masha, Waqf, etc., etc., they, they designed them as we are good as architects to do, and any kind of collectivity, they call it public, and public is the state of Israel, and as people, we have been colonized through our own collectivity, because then it was turned into public, and it is it was the perfect form, legally for Israel to expropriate our land because this is public, public is state. And we do accept that public is state, right? I mean, as, as architects, we have been involved on this, the way we never problematize our relation with what public and how we design public. So I am, I mean, from what you hear from me, I am suspicious towards public, definitely. <laughs> I have been always felt in somehow not fully belonging. And as an architect, I'm trying to find ways in which we create other forms of collectivity and coexist in a better form together. I interpret that question also as a almost pedagogical suggestion for the architects. Mm. And I was thinking also of your project, Lina, in Tartu, where with this very long process uh, of how it came to be that people started to use this place in new ways. Can you, can you say a little bit about that and your own role as suggesting and implying you also worked with, uh, for instance, uh, exhibition spaces and other kinds of pedagogical parts of your building projects? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, as a process, um, basically, how to, how to create out of this museum a collective and a community building, that was also one of the challenges, that it's not a, because we get to the, the sense of a national museum being this kind of a dusty place that is just an icon sitting on the environment and that basically untouched building and the whole challenge was how to transform that uh, building into a, an incubator of culture basically a place for uh, for Estonians to produce to 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 meet together to uh, in a way uh, have an active uh, role uh, in in building uh, culture and uh, like an open identity that is never fixed because the question of identity is one that is completely flowing. Uh, and uh, the, the, the process of 10 years was also to dialogue with Estonians to kind of present that project in municipalities, to talk with the locals, uh, but also talk with the conservators. There are 100 people working and uh, managing that institution in that uh, context and, and trying through drawing tools, through a large scale uh, like um, in situ models uh, to kind of bring the hand of the users uh, into the making of the project by devising a system which is that of the boxes for example and then we would move them and try to see how the how to emerge uh, that that uh, building and as you saw in some of the photos also the scale of that project also uh, necessitated that uh, or like let's say triggered that the whole uh, like population would make a manifestation would go all together uh, like uh, into the site of the, the the building so so this kind of tight relationship between interaction with the users but also with the uh, uh, like uh, city uh, inhabitants as well uh, into into that uh, project um i i think like the I mean, the question is always like, how do we understand the status quo and how do we also question it? As an architect, for me specifically, I'm working with, of course, public institutions, I'm working with the political structures, and I have to deal with that also, like this kind of uh, 
like uh, dynamics that constitute these. And uh, my uh, take on that is how to critically understand what constitute these dynamics and how to offer kind of uh, an alternative way, how to open the space uh, for uh, for evolution and for uh, like appropriation in a different manner than what is uh, meant to be uh, in a certain way. By that, we have to come to an end. I don't know if you have an additional comment. Yes. One comment yeah? is that, you know, we would have loved to have you among us, Lena, and to have <laughs> lunch know. with you yes. right now would have been wonderful. I am I'm very keen to become to know you very soon. So I, I hope so too. Thank, thank you so much. And I'm deeply sorry uh, mm. I had the special issues this week. So I hope we will get the chance, I'm sure. There are, there are, of course, very many sort of questions in the air. For instance, when you start to engage in a place, can you ever leave that engagement? And, and uh, questions like yes. that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but we will have to take that as a rhetorical question. And uh, by that uh, ending this uh, Fermidog, this morning session, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, have lunch and come back. Did I forget something uh, of a more formal kind? No, no, no very good. Yeah. Just uh, to all the students and uh, 1 p.m. So it's, you know, but you get a sandwich outside, so you could be. <laughs> so thank you very much again, Lena, for being here with us. Thank you, everyone, and uh, did have a great lunch. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Hi everybody, <clears throat> welcome back uh, to this year's edition of uh, Lund Architecture Symposium. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch, uh, all students and guests and faculties. Um, and that you're ready for the afternoon session here now. So uh, during the morning session we, we listened to Lina Gottme joining us from Paris uh, uh, online. And then we had Sandy Hilal presenting in real life here um, at Lund University. And we have assistance from Jesper Magnusson in the discussion. And we had uh, moderators Gunnar Sandin and Fredrik Linander taking care of the, of the or, uh, organizing the discussions there. So this afternoon we'll cover some slightly different aspects of this year's topic. Um, we will continue to focus on architecture that have used design as an active force in societal restructurings. Uh, um, but the afternoon we'll look more into socio-material aspects of architecture uh, and urban landscapes, uh, adaptive re reuse and tectonics in buildings and landscapes, uh, as various means of the and various means of the social in architecture. Uh, we will uh, have two lectures now, uh, following on each other, and then we will have a short coffee break. Um, and after that, we continue with uh, one lecture and the moderated uh, discussion to conclude uh, the day. Just so all of you know the kind of general layout of the afternoon. Um, for to help with uh, the discussions, we have uh, Monica Jonsson, lecturer at the Architecture and Built Environment, and uh, so to serve as moderator together with Ellen Down, um, also lecturer at the department. Uh, so I basically give the word to Monica and mm -hmm. uh, wish you all an exciting afternoon here. Mm, thank you, uh, Payuan, and it's good to see so many in the room. We're not used to that and we had a wonderful first uh, half of the day. So uh, now, now it's time for Søren Nilsen. Um, and Søren is a partner at Van Kunst and Architects in Copenhagen a firm uh, that was established in 1971 and regarded as one of the country's leading uh, socially and environmentally engaged businesses. Uh, he received his uh, Master of Architecture from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen. Um, Van Kunsten is devoted to design strategies for sustainability, in particular resource protection, reuse, social and cultural aspects. The firm undertakes its own research and considers architectural design at all scales, 
in particular tectonic strategies, adaptable solution, weathering of materials and renovation, and the preservation of resources through low maintenance and design for disassembly. Responsible for Van Kunsten's uh, research and development act activities, uh, so Nielsen initiated the innovation project Nordic Build Component Reuse, uh, which explores new ways of repurposing waste building components as strategy for preserving embodied energy. Nielsen holds a position as external uh, external assistant professor at uh, Royal Academy and has lectured at universities and professional organizations in Scandinavia, Germany, the UK, Portugal, USA, Russia, and was visit recently visiting professor in, at the Technical Universität in Vienna. So we will give Soren a warm hand. Welcome. Thank you. Do I have sound? Yeah, but, uh, yeah thanks for it's a great honor to, to be here. And I'm, I'm a kind of stand in for my colleague uh, Jan Albregsen, who, uh, who finally got hit by the coronavirus. Uh, so he's not here today. But I can say that, that uh, when, uh, Jens um, focuses more on uh, urban planning, and uh, mine uh, is more on, on uh, architecture, building architecture, and uh, materials and sustainability. So, so that is where I put my, um, my uh, cards today. Um, and uh, we are in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, a medium-sized uh, Danish office. We are 80, 80 uh, architects, mostly architects, some, some constructing architects, and some uh, even a couple of engineers which have been employed um, in the recent years. But what are we doing at Van Kunsten? Uh, we are mostly, um, we are mostly um, designing... Uh, Affordable and sustainable housing projects. Uh, social housing is, uh, um, is the bulk of our uh, architectural production. Uh, and uh, we, have, uh, we have over the, the, the last 50 years um, uh, developed a number of, uh, of social strategies and ways to, uh, to very strictly prioritize uh, the, the budgets and the, uh, and the means and the uh, building um, the construction systems so we, so we can get a high quality even with very small budgets. And, and this is an, an example of a, a prefabricated a social housing project uh, with with a, a rent 20% uh, under the um, uh, the usual uh, rent for social housing and 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 yet it 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 we, we succeeded in in uh, in in making a a, a quite a complex um, um, shape of the building um, it, it it curves uh, like a crescent and uh, in, instead of just being a, a strict block I'm not going into depth with these uh, with these uh, first projects I'm, I'm going to show just, just a couple of, as, a, as a tasting menu and then I will dive into a couple of historical projects and then I will uh, talk about some some of our newer um, uh, projects um, which are which are relevant uh, in in the uh, in the light of the, the climate situation um, but here, here's another <coughs> here's another strategy where we, we had a social housing um, project with a very low budget, and it was uh, situated by the harbour of Copenhagen. So we decided to to make very strict and and boring uh, blocks, urban blocks. But uh, we we uh, we uh, arranged them on top of a public um, a bathing facility on, on pillars in the water. And uh, so this is I, I guess this is a, a typical strategy that that we want to we want to engage the public life uh, of the city uh, if, if we if we in any anything we um, we um, produce is is uh, is um, meant to be useful for for uh, for the um, residents but also for for the rest of the city and then this is a, an example of, of uh, that uh, it's open to the public and one of the many many uh, public beaches in uh, in Copenhagen harbor uh, which has been um, developed developed over the last uh, 20 years where the water has become clean etc uh, a similar strategy here in Oslo uh, a recent project uh, it, it is uh, only uh, one and a half year uh, 
uh, old. Uh, it, it is in, in Bispevika, uh, right beside the, the uh, Munch Museum, so it's a very ex expensive address. And uh, th this is private housing, and the, uh, the square meter price is 250,000 uh, Norwegian uh, crowns, but, but it's much. But all of these very, very um, wealthy people who, who, uh, who have bought uh, the apartments here, and, and it, they were actually very easy to sell. And some, some even uh, bought two, uh, just for, as an investment or just as a nice to have or something. But, but um, they have to, they have to uh, tolerate that they are living on top of a public uh, beach in Oslo. So, so once again, and, 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 the, and, the, um, uh, and the ground floor is filled up with, uh, with uh, restaurants and uh, service um, uh, facilities. So, so <coughs> there's no there's no private territory really. If you, if you, if if you if you want to live in such a central and such an attractive place, then you will have to accept that uh, you, you you have to share it with uh, with uh, ordinary people, so to speak. Uh, and besides from that, it's 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 a, it's a, a Norwegian Venice. So uh, <coughs> the whole the whole. Um, the whole urban plan is made on water, which is not very sustainable because it's standing on, on concrete pillars which are 40 meters long and it's, it's, a, it's a, a crazy way to build actually, but, but a, a great way to, to invest and become super rich. Um, and and uh, you can see it from, from above here, from the Monk Museum, uh, where I, I visited in, uh, in uh, December with, the, with, the, uh, with snow. Uh, and, and, uh, and notice that the roofs here, they are uh, they're pitched, they're not flat. Uh, the rest of uh, the surrounding uh, urban area is, is cubistic, strictly, uh, 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 strictly uh, cut, uh, like boxes, and uh, so it, it looks like uh, Kansas City or something. Sorry, for, uh, for <laughs> sorry to the American <laughs> who are with us today, but uh, it, you, it it can be everywhere. Abu Dhabi, Amsterdam, Amsterdam uh, it could be everywhere. But but uh, we uh, celebrate the the, uh, the regional uh, architecture. We like to we like the, the e e no matter what what kind of um, uh, typologies we we are working with, we, we like to celebrate. Uh, the place that we are. Uh, so, so this is ubiqu ubiquitous, uh, generic uh, boxes. Uh, we are sick and tired of them, and uh, actually, we, we are, yeah, uh, we, <laughs> we have fierce uh, the debates about this in Denmark, and uh, we are, uh, of course, engaged in that. Um, now, back to uh, a, a, a look back in history. Uh, uh, our office was founded in uh, about. Well, it, it can't be discussed exactly uh, when, but uh, about 1972, and um, and uh, it was uh, it, it was a group of uh, of it, it has always been a collective, and, and uh, it was four young uh, architects with with uh, they were very political uh, engaged, and um, and uh, they were uh, in particular they were engaged in in uh, reacting against uh, the the post-war uh, industrial. Uh, housing, um, we, we, you know it in Sweden as well. The Million Program. Uh, uh, there was a similar pro program in uh, in Denmark. It, it was very. It was actually it was a, um, a strategical political achievement to to build that many um, homes after the, the after the World War, and uh, there was a, a big need for homes. So so so. But but. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, the, re the reaction was against uh, the the scale and the monotony and uh, the alienation. Uh, so you could you could at, at that time you could choose between uh, the, the post-war um, million program or you could uh, or you could uh, choose a, a single-family home. And uh, both were boring and conf conform. Conf uh, there was a lot of conformity and uh, we. Uh, the, the uh, founding partners rea reacted against it, and uh, they, they uh, in a competition that was the first uh, competition that the office w won, uh, they, they proposed uh, a, a favela-like way of building, um, just out in the open uh, fields, you built as you wanted, and uh, you should you should engage as as a user or um, participant uh, and, and decide the architecture yourself. It was a, an open work strategy, you could say. Uh, and, and we 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 still uh, we are still very inspired by by the, 
the, the idea of the open work and the idea of participation and the, uh, the idea that that uh, architecture and and uh, uh, urban areas they are li they are living organisms they are dynamic projects they are not uh, static objects um, and um, but and and this this uh, in, uh, reaction from 1772 it has become uh, relevant again today where you you see uh, this is from Copenhagen but it could be anywhere. It's the same house are built everywhere, and it's built in concrete, and it's clad with bricks, uh, heavy CO2 pollute, polluting uh, materials. And uh, what you can get with this, you can get absolute a maximum of uh, CO2 outlets and an absolute minimum of quality. And that is what you build everywhere. It's a problem. It's a challenge. It's it's a, it's something we have to we have to do something about it. And uh, that is what what um, yeah. Um, we are we are fueled by this uh, by this uh, uh, um, uh, well, yeah. Back in seventy two, there was also the dream that that the uh, the uh, participants or the uh, the, the future um, uh, tenants they should uh, they should uh, take part in the design of the architecture, and uh, there was uh, I think that was the beginning of this tradition for for having workshops with uh, with uh, user uh, participation, and and we have it today very much in renovation projects where where we actually have existing uh, tenants to to uh, to be in dialogue with, um, but this was this was the first. Um, uh, Attempt to 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 engage um, the users actually, um, and <coughs> and now you, I will show you a strange image. Why where where uh, why is this uh, photo relevant? I guess that uh, most of you take that kind of uh, photographs when you are on holiday and you uh, you were walking in the rural uh, places or uh, brownfield areas. Or so you 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 take these photos and you can't explain why. But I can explain it. It's because it's beautiful. It's uh, the, the it's, it's it's a kind of beauty that you cannot uh, you cannot design. Um, you you cannot make this on, on your sketch block. You cannot you cannot make it in the computer. Only one thing can make a, a composition like this, and uh, and and that is time, and uh, and uh, participation by uh, by non architects. Uh, there will be changes over time. There will be random materials. There will be weathering, uh, and and all of a sudden you have a you have a composition like like this. And and, and as an architect, we, we just we just have to sur surrender. We can't we can't provide anything as beautiful as this. But uh, we we can try, of course. And that that was what uh, happened, happened in in uh, 70, 72 with with the first project of Van Kunsten. And that is our mother project. And it's very nice to have a mother project uh, to refer back to all the time. And I think the, the, the strategies in this project is present in everything we do today. Um, and. Of course, I, I have no shares in, in this project. I was a, I was a little boy back in, in these days, but but uh, but uh, I know it as well as if I had uh, designed it myself. Uh, this drawing, uh, you now you, perhaps you understand the photo from before. It's it's a, it's a, an attempt to to make architecture become a a, a composition uh, with with a randomness and uh, uh, and and uh, an openness. Similar to to what you what you see uh, with buildings uh, that are uh, aged and uh, which has been transformed and uh, changed uh, over many years, um, so you have these floating elements and and, and that kind of uh, compositions are, are extremely interesting because you can play with them. You can't you can never fix it. Uh, they, they they become um, as a source of inspiration. What happened was that this was built. It looks like this, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's very re regionally uh, inspired uh, architecture. Actually, actually, there was some, some uh, someone who nicknamed it uh, Emil von Lönnberg uh, architecture, and uh, <coughs> because we we simply wanted to. to uh, the idea is that it, it should be self-grown, but in in a, in a, in a 
a well-organized society like Denmark, nothing can be self-grown, of course. And this is social housing, and it looks exactly today. It looks like exactly like when it was built, because no, uh, no, uh, none of the tenants are allowed to change anything, but because they do not own it. And uh, and and furthermore, uh, the building rights has been um, ex explored uh, or. Uh, uh, um, you have used all the uh, building rights from the beginning. Uh, uh, that is what you always do. Or, or otherwise, the, the business model do, uh, doesn't work. So, so, um, so nothing has changed. But it looks like something that could be self-grown and, and something like that could uh, ch uh, change. But it's an image. It's it's. Uh, sadly, it's it's only an image, but but it works, and uh, people are very happy living there. And and uh, now the the um, average age of the uh, of the inhabitants are very uh, very high because they they uh, they just don't move out of it. Um, but uh, yeah, this is how the how how the spaces between uh, uh, the buildings uh, looks like. And uh, as as if you if you have um, if you know the, the the notion of of the edge zones, this is where where the this grammar of uh, of zone dividing the public space and the territory ter territory was uh, was co coined at least in uh, in, in Denmark. Um, but but the, and, and and this project was really a, an inspiration. It has been copied by many many offices, and it has it it, it uh, it's it's a it's a typology and uh, what what you call the uh, uh, low dense um, housing, and the 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 basic idea the recipe here is is one one we uh, use a lot. Uh, uh, today, uh, you have you have small you have small groups of um, of, of homes, it, it typically an, a number of uh, um, thirty to forty units, which is uh, sociological uh, optimal because you can you you know every one of your neighbors, you know uh, who they are and uh, if they live there or not. Uh, but you don't you don't have that that um, there, there are so many of them that you you don't have to talk uh, for a long time every time you meet. You can you can just say hi. Um, and you can choose the, the neighbors that you want to engage more with uh, in a better way. And uh, in this project, there are streets and there are courtyards. That is uh, the two the two spatial typologies. And uh, and each of these uh, have their own community house. And I think it's a project uh, in in the world with most community houses per capita. Um, and and they even have a they even have a, a, a common community house, so so they they are very well um, uh, equipped with uh, with the community spaces. Uh, inside uh, the um, in the interiors, uh, th there's also a, a grammar which we which we also also use today with with a, a large a, a big contrast between small and and the uh, and large spaces. Um, you 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 probably. <laughs> Think it's it's very banal now, but it, 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 this was the first time in, in Denmark where you made an open kitchen, where you could uh, where you could um, cook and uh, and um, uh, be together with your family at the same time. Um, and the materials are very uh, are very nice. You can't uh, there's no budget for this today to to have uh, true brick walls inside the uh, in, in the interior, but um, and uh, you. <coughs> Here you can you can you can see how uh, another reason why it can't be changed is that it, it's it's uh, it's uh, built in concrete. Concrete is a wonderful material and a very terrible material, and and it's a, it's a huge challenge today. It's one of the uh, the, the largest challenges we have that uh, that um, concrete it cannot be changed very easily, and uh, and uh, furthermore, it, it cannot be disassembled because it, it, we have cast uh, connections. Uh, so, so this is an, the last reason why why uh, the, the tenants can never change anything in this project. And pe perhaps, perhaps it, it has been there for so long time, so it's it's time to to get it listed or something because it's it, it is a it is a a, a kind of. Uh, yeah, residential, uh, architectural uh, milestone. Uh, another milestone, uh, and, and uh, quite relevant today, is, uh, is this project, which is a housing community. Um, in 
uh, I, I guess it's uh, 15 kilometers from Copenhagen. It's in a rural, rural uh, district, uh, and uh, so people are living uh, in the country, countryside, but they are living very close together. They, they are, uh, there was a slogan back then: uh, "Take the cities out to the country." And uh, that is what this project does. It, it takes it, it establishes an urban community very far from uh, from the cities, um, and and uh, they are, there are two wings in this, and uh, both of them uh, contains the, the residences, and, and they are placed on the, on the either side of uh, an interior street, and uh, where they meet um, in the angle, uh, there's a large uh, community um, space. Uh, here's how it, how it looks from from uh, from above, and um, and it, it what is characteristic with this is a very very tight integration uh, between building and landscape, and the roofs they are almost biting the grass, and uh, and and then they are racing uh, up to some some uh, towers with with small uh, with small roof terraces uh, on top of it, and um, yeah another. Uh, if you look at, at the section here, you can you can see how how tightly the the uh, um, the terrain is integrated. We have our own, own landscapes landscape architects, which uh, has which was really important actually. Uh, I think uh, because because um, ah, that has put that 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 been putting so much effort in in uh, in adapting uh, the, uh, the the natural terrain to to the uh, to the buildings, and uh, that is why we have we have. Um, uh, several uh, a terracing um, of of uh, the interior. Uh, here's uh, the, the interior street. Uh, this is where you enter your 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 home, um, and this is where the children are able to play. It's it's not heated, but it's uh, but it's covered uh, with greenhouse glass, and uh, and so so it's it's a winter garden uh, from where you enter, um, and this is an entrance, and. Um, of course, there's a, there's a, a it, it is a like like a big collective, and you can't live here without engaging in in your neighbors and being a part of the of the community. But it's also very attractive, and there's a lot of demand for places like this today. And uh, back then, there was a, a way to finance it, uh, an attractive way. But uh, but to, today, it's uh, it's it's really difficult. Uh, it, it, it's a huge challenge to 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 get a mortgage loan uh, as a collective. You have you can do it as an indiv individual person, but you can't get uh, it, you can't get the fi financing. But but there's a, a large uh, or huge um, um, a demand actually. Uh, yeah, that's one of one of the small uh, urban uh, niches where you can where you can sit um, inside. And a, typ a typical interior situation here, you 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 can you can uh, uh, once ag once again there's. A, a, a kind of edge zone. You can uh, negotiate the territory uh, between uh, privacy and, and the public uh, by by um, by filtering the view from from uh, the um, from the private uh, residence into the to the uh, public uh, entrance zone or semi-public because it, it, it it's of course it's uh, there's only access for people who who uh, who, who live there. Um, and then, then you can have curtains, of course, to to uh, to keep uh, private. Uh, and but but the um, but uh, the uh, the uh, spaces in 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 a home like that, are, it, it's very compact. And uh, and and there are solutions like this where you can where you can see the the uh, the kitchen table is is um, uh, well, it's it's pushed into into the uh, the terrain uh, in order to to uh, to make. Um, um, to make the kitchen more efficient uh, at a very at a very small place, and, and that is a price you pay if you want if you want all this community space it, and for the same rent, uh, you have to you have to give away some of the uh, private area and, and and live on 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 uh, um, on uh, less uh, square meters, but uh, but with all these uh, all these um, common facilities. Um, so it, it, it's it's very compact and very uh, very uh, <laughs> uh, elaborate uh, spatially, uh, and, uh, and 
And um, and in return, you get a kitchen like this, a big professional kitchen where you can uh, where you can cook, and they they have a common. Uh, you can eat together every day. Uh, you don't have to, but uh, but you have. Uh, I, I guess you have to do it sometimes. Um, and uh, and here's where where here's the eating situation. This this very big uh, um, common space, and from from. Uh, from this old uh, housing community to something completely different uh, at, at the other uh, at the other uh, end of the of the scale, um, a very small um, house that we did um, five years ago for some young developers who wanted to uh, to uh, to provide uh, alternative uh, housing in Copenhagen, uh, temporary. Or, or with a with a ten year years perspective in development zones in Copenhagen, um, where where they would like to offer um, small small houses where you could uh, where you could live uh, with a very low rent, but uh, but uh, in a r relative uh, central position um, in the city, and um, and uh, they they wanted they wanted to to um, to use. Uh, discarded uh, containers taken out of the of the um, shipping fleet, uh, and and it was a 40 foot container, and we we cut it uh, in the middle, and we uh, placed the two uh, parts um, against each other, and um, and then we we <coughs> we made an addition um, with a, a very very simple and uh, and cheap construction, uh, which was a, a winter garden, which which was the entrance, and which led to a roof terrace. Uh, so uh, in in that very very small um, very in that very small home you had tremendous qualities uh, extraordinary qualities uh, for a very low price and uh, <coughs> the, it, the policy is that that in in uh, uh, in Copenhagen and Denmark uh, everywhere uh, you you can uh, uh, the, the supply of um, of uh, residential uh, typologies is not very big. Uh, it, it's almost like a communist country. Uh, you, you can choose between a very few um, types of, uh, of apartments, and uh, they are all very uh, expensive. And you need two incomes, and um, and you need to work your ass uh, off uh, in order to afford it. And uh, but but what if you could? What if you could choose another way of uh, living, like uh, a very small? Uh, this is uh, 25 square meters, um, having a high, a high uh, interior quality, uh, a, a, a high um, residential quality, but uh, but uh, saving a lot of uh, money for other purposes. There might be periods in your in your life where, where that was uh, that would be attractive. So uh, these these two containers that were put up against each other, and then there, there were uh, the the. Um, there was a hole in the wall, so so uh, so we got a, a, a larger space and we covered it all with the wood uh, inside, uh, in order to uh, in order to make it nice to sit to lean up against. Uh, so wood wood has, uh, has some qualities; um, it, it doesn't steal away the the, the body heat uh, from you. So it, it's very nice for small rooms to have uh, to have a wooden cladding, um, and. <coughs> A lot of um, intimate uh, intimacy in in uh, in a, um, a home like this, and you could even have a a, a luxury kitchen. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, um, you, you don't need austerity just because you you um, you live in a in a small um, at a small area. Um, and well, yeah, it looks good from the outside in the evening. Uh, I can I, I can see I talk too much I I, I have too many slides it, it doesn't matter I, I don't have to uh, it, it's it's not necessary to show all uh, all my slides you can you can just uh, cut me off when uh, when uh, the time is uh, is gone um, no but but we we have uh, we've been working with sustainability uh, for for uh, for at least uh, three decades and uh, that has my been my uh, engagement uh, mostly. Uh, so we are in, in a situation now where we have uh, we have um, been through uh, energy crisis back in the 60s uh, or 70s, and uh, now we have a uh, we have a, a climate crisis. Uh, it's not a supply crisis. It, it, it didn't used to be a supply crisis. Uh, it, uh, it, it now it has become a supply crisis once again. I think that will uh, that will. Uh, uh, 
push uh, us to act uh, more efficiently than, than uh, when it's only a climate crisis, because it's not so uh, uh, urgent. Um, but we have to we have to do something uh, about the, the resources, and uh, I um, I um, made some uh, research in in uh, in how to how we could uh, preserve uh, our resources. Sorry, this, this is in, this is a Norwegian headline here, but you can read it. Um, um, it this is a resource preservation hierarchy, and uh, the, we we have we have three plans. Uh, we have a plan A, which is a cultural strategy. The cultural strategy is about uh, is about beauty, and it's about uh, lovability. It's about uh, appreciation. So when we are architects, with the first the first thing we should think of is how to make a a, a building people love, because then it, that would be the uh, the uh, ultimate protection of the resources, because they, they, it would not be demolished, it would be listed, it would be, become a part of uh, the UN uh, World Heritage, um, and um, that, that we should always aim for that, make World Heritage. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, there might be <laughs> the client is an idiot or something. But um, it's not you, of course, as an architect. But we should. We should have a plan B, uh, and uh, that is a, f a functional strategy. We should aim for robustness in our buildings, so uh, they can be converted from one function to another, um, and uh, they could be changed from from offices to uh, to. Um, to uh, residences or schools or something, and uh, that can happen with the right geometries and the right structural systems. Um, but even even then, you have to have a, a plan C, a safety net, a, a, an additional safety net, and that is a technical strategy called design for disassembly. That is a reversibility, and that is what we are dealing with um, uh, when we are talking about circular economy, uh, which is circular. Uh, technology uh, when it when it comes to architecture, um, and and both the both the functional and the technical strategy feeds back into the cultural because you can you can use the the necessities of the functional and technical uh, strategies to to enrich the the the, um, uh, the architecture. You can use the technical strategies to to make uh, to make uh, ornaments and uh, tectonic details which are beautiful and which are, uh, are easy. To to understand and um, make make the architectural uh, meaningful, and uh, you can and you can use the robustness to uh, to uh, enable a change of the building, uh, and and uh, and uh, enabling change that also means a democratic potentially democratic architecture, so so people can uh, can. Uh, can adapt the buildings to their needs over time, and uh, the, the idea is that that buildings are uh, they they are standing there for many hundreds of, of years. Uh, otherwise, it's not uh, we 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 don't use our resources in the right way. Um, and the the, the most uh, the easiest way to to um, obtain um, a design for disassembly or, or a circular. Um, uh, Construction is to is to make timber buildings. Timber buildings they are always assembled with something which can be disassembled again. They joints with screws and bolts, and uh, they are not glued together. They are not cast together. So so that is a, that is a, <laughs> this is a lower, the lower hanging fruits. And this is an example of this. This is a Den Denmark's tallest uh, wooden building, uh, four staggering four uh, stories high. Uh, it's not a Big achievement uh, in, in uh, worldwide, but uh, but it, it's in Denmark. Uh, we, Denmark is such a concrete country. It's a, it's a major achievement. Um, um, and uh, here 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 we have the um, uh, the site plan. And uh, once again, it it's, it's arranged like like uh, the the project, the first our mother project. Uh, small groups of buildings, uh, each with their uh, access system, where you can um, where you meet your neighbors and uh, three groups of three um, blocks, where you again you have a small society, and then they they form a a bigger. Uh, a bigger society with with the, with a common garden in the middle. Um, so that is that is well that that is uh, Van Kunsten by routine you could say. Uh, and then 
we add to this uh, uh, a structural system, uh, which we, which we have developed with uh, with some um, uh, engineers, and uh, it's it's a it's a system based on there's a there's a stairwell as a core, um, load bearing core, and then we have a, a, a surrounding sky of um, of uh, pillars and beams, uh, and that is a that is an open structure. Um, here's how it, it it looks when it's under construction, and uh, you have this frame and filling. Um, uh, concept, uh, which uh, in enables you to to uh, to uh, make a very free design of the facades, and also it could be, could be changed over time, which is very important. But you can also, with this system, you can also configure um, the, um, uh, the 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 block in in many ways, and you can use it in the dialogue with the clients. Uh, there's a large uh, freedom in configuration, but you can also use it when you need to uh, have a restoration of the. A major, major refurbishment uh, 50 years later, and you can change it. Uh, there are walls which which uh, the tenants can can raise and uh, um, or, or uh, remove uh, according to their needs. And then we have the access systems, which which are different uh, from each block. So there are no there are no. Uh, uh, that's not one uh, block uh, which is uh, like the other, and uh, that it gives you a, a large. Um, uh, it, it enables you to configure this in many ways, and, and a lot of um, housing types. Too many, of course, but but we, we like to demonstrate that we could do everything with this system. So, yeah. Um. Yeah, and the facades they can be designed according to to we have uh, engineers in Denmark who who likes to to simulate the daylight in a very very uh, specific way, and uh, every feet, every space uh, every room uh, is customized according to day, daylight, and, and an open facade system like this it it, uh, it it's very it's a, a very nice way to to meet uh, these. Uh, Engineering uh, needs, and and then we have a facade like this, uh, or, or a, an atmosphere like this, and and uh, um, notice the roofs once again. Uh, it, it's not common anymore to see a roof, but but uh, since we have a, we have made a, a wooden claddings without any uh, impregnation of uh, of uh, of the wood, uh, then it needs to be to be constructive, um, constructively. Um, uh, covered, and uh, we so we use uh, large uh, uh, roofs, and uh, we also need uh, cordons uh, as the profiling uh, to lead away the water and to to subdivide the facades, and uh, that is very nice for the windows and for the facade, but it's also very nice for us as uh, as people, because we are also protected. I mean this. Um, if I do this in Indonesia or in uh, anywhere in the world, it means shelter. You, everyone can understand it. But this this basic typology uh, has has been um, removed by um, modern architecture and uh, and some kind of mental hygiene ideas about that uh, buildings they should be sh uh, sharp uh, cut sharply uh, cut and and. Um, I, I don't know why. I, I think I think it's time whether we ask ourselves why don't we be why don't we want to be protected by by for instance a roof anymore? Um, and uh, you are waiting to to cut me off, but 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 uh, <laughs> I can I can see it. I can I can uh, I can skip some of the. Um, uh, but I, what what I wanted to talk about was um, was uh, renovation, and uh, why renovation is so important. Uh, because because uh, we are not going to in, in in our part of the world we don't need to build any more square meters we have enough already uh, so so what we should uh, what, what, what will we become unemployed as architects and no we won't not we, but we will uh, we will start um, our projects will be about uh, renovation and refurbishment and uh, transformation and uh, that will make our uh, our 
architectural work much more rich, much more interesting because you, uh, like you can, uh, like you can see in, in, the, in this um, at this facade with a renovated building, uh, you can you can get uh, historical layers. You can have you, you get a complexity from uh, from uh, different traces of history uh, and uh, and one more detail, and that would be the last. We we stop with that. Um, What 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 is interesting is uh, is um, to to get time into our uh, architecture uh, and and the detail like this you can't uh, it was like the old building I, I showed in the beginning you can't de you can't design this uh, you you can uh, you can only time can design it and uh, I think that that if we start renovating transforming uh, we 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 can get a new a new kind of architecture with, which is much more uh, human, much more relaxed. It, it's full of uh, mistakes. It's it's full of uh, randomness. It's uh, it's um, it's more. It's much more like like we are ourselves. We are not perfect, and uh, and buildings should not. Uh, they should um, reflect that um, that we are not perfect as a, as a species. Um, and uh, it's, it's not healthy to, to aim for the perfect. So, so that, that is why I, I, I look forward to, to a future architecture based on uh, um, reparation and uh, transformation, and etc. So, they, yeah, and uh, I don't have much more time. Ten, ten nine, eight, seven. I, I stop here. Yeah. So. <laughs> So thank you so much for coming here on this very short notice. And I, I think we should say to our audience that there is an exhibition right now at the Danish uh, Architecture Center uh, collecting, uh, it's a kind of assembly of uh, experiences from your office uh, from beginning to now, so to say, where you focus on, on the dwelling. And as you did, as you showed with Ting Warden that you also had, the, it was like an, a new typology. Uh, you were quite humble when you spoke about it, but that actually shaped lots of uh, uh, how, how we looked upon um, dwellings and homes and new ways to share space. Uh, we are, I will give the word to, to Elin here. Thank you. Because you're going to introduce our next speaker. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So our next speaker is uh, Iris Duppen. And uh, she's a landscape architect and a partner at Lutz and Partners in Kansberg. She's also part of the Bavarian Chambers of Architects as well as the Luxembourg Chambers of Architects. And also since 2006, she's a scholar of Villa Massimo in Rome. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Landscape Architecture from the Beckett University Leeds and completed her Master at the University of Kassel. In 2004, Duper founded her Landscape Architecture office ILO in Munich, where temporal and permanent installations are created for the private and public sector. Additionally, she collaborates with the region of Lazio for territorial studies, um, which were presented at international conferences and exhibitions. And uh, as we said, since 2016, she's a partner of Latsen Partner, where the focus lies on the complex systems of the future of landscape architecture and urbanism. By combining innovative technologies with tradition and knowledge of the site, um, the office creates an interdisciplinary dialogue and achieves through, through that a careful and sustainable shaping of our urban living spaces. Uh, we should also mention projects such as Parco Dora in Turin and the Landscape Park of Duisburg North, which shows the adaptive reuse of post-industrial structures, which are recognized in numerous publications and prizes. So we welcome Iris to the table. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation of the organizers. Um, I'm very honored to present our work here. And I would also want to take up some ideas of my esteemed pre-speakers, uh, Jesper, when he said contemporary archaeology, archaeology is the search of narratives. This is surely something which is applicable to our projects. And also what Lina and Shandi said, 
that uh, we should find a way we relate to our territory and to share it rather than to own it. The topic of your conference is reactivating architectures. And as we've heard, we are landscape architects, even though we have also architects um, in our office. Uh, we work in teams and we are an old office, like uh, you were uh, just presenting, sir. And our office was founded in 68 by Peter and Anneliese Latz in Aachen, in Germany, on the Belgian border. And Tilman Latz was taking it over in 2011. And since 2016, we uh, together we lead this office. Tilman Latz, Latz is an architect, landscape architect, and town planner. So I would like to show you our office. This is the building where we work. It's in the countryside, in the hills outside Munich. Um, Peter Latz has designed this wooden house himself. Uh, we have solar panels and we are sort of 10 months of the year self-sustaining in terms of energy. Um, our uh, main focus in the projects um, is that there is a combination of different parameters uh, and categories I would like to, to share with you as students, since we have a lot of students here today, and we are not architects shaping architecture, which we have just seen in Zoran's case, for example. So we deal with existing architectural structures and um, just to give you an insight on parameters which are very important for flexible open structures and for social well-being within these open structures. So there are categories like or parameters like reuse and upcycling of architectural elements in open structures, public space, which we understand needs inclusion and social well-being in order to function. Then identity is a very important factor and regaining a sense of belonging since we often work in situations which are sort of uh, wastelands or lands nobody can access, nobody wants to access, neglected sites. Urban sustainability and climate adapted spaces have been a prior issue since Duisburg Nord. Uh, Peter Lutz very well described it in his book Rust Red, if you don't know yet. And then circularity transformed the existing into a new aesthetic place for action. Uh, you will see in the projects I show, it's a, it's a result you cannot plan. It's a, a result between the dialogue of the existing, the value of existing elements and a new sense of meaning which is added. So I would like to show our experiences we made in a long time span uh, between 2004 and today on three projects, Esplanade Taz, which has just been finished last year, Sinterbeckenplatz Belval in Luxembourg, we are still working on, and Paco do Spino, you probably all know, but nevertheless, I. I would like to share it with you and um, to say the first project we began uh, with a VGV Verfahren, the second one was an international competition we won and the third one also international competition. So here again, the importance for the students is to, to make a project really work. There should be a combination of categories and uh, it's not enough to have only one category. You have to have the mix, you have to bring them together. Sustainability, inclusion and new aesthetics is a new quality of experience. So, I would like to start with the project uh, TAS, which means Textile Artificiel du Sud-Est in Lyon. It's a former silk production plant, which was constructed in 1924, uh, but it's been renamed in TAS in 1935, and it's been producing until 1980. It's one of 14 uh, silk production plants in the area. 
And uh, as you see on the old plan, it's on the eastern suburbs of Lyon. At the time, there were fields. Uh, there was only this plant. And on the southern side, uh, individual housing. Um, so in 2004, Greater Lyon uh, decided to transform this uh, whole sector, which is called Carrier de Soie, 500 hectares. Uh, and it was uh, Bruno Dimitier who made the master plan for it. And it was a key pillar for the development of this Eastern Lyonnais region that the industrial heritage should play a role in this new development plan. So, as you were just mentioning, Søren, what was uh, demanded by the Metropole de Lyon was the consultation of the public right from the beginning. There was uh, the agency RNS uh, included in this project to find a way what are the expectations of the uh, new residents and what are the expectations of the Ville de Lyon. So, as you can see, the, one of the major ideas of the residents was to have an esplanade vert and a uh, green esplanade. Uh, and this is what we tried to realize. Um, it's on three uh, communities are participating in this pilot project. It's the Metropole de Lyon, vaux en velin and Ville-Urbain. Um, so, as I said, we always work in teams, often with architects, town planners, sociologues. Uh, so we're most of the time never alone. We're always part of a team. And um, so I'm very happy to, to present you this work, which was sort of a common result with residents and other planners and the Metropole de Lyon, vaux en villain et ville urbain. This is how we found the architectural relics of the produ production hall of the silk um, fabrics. It was mainly uh, mineral slabs uh, covering the whole soil, so it, the soil couldn't drain. The uh, identity factor was the tower, uh, the water tower, and um, that was the moment we decided this is the space which should be transformed. And here are the ideas which we try to transform the, the expectations of the inhabitants and also the future uh, more uh, in terms of microclimate, much more adapted project to these really hot summers in Lyon. Here you see in section uh, how we changed the soil. So first of all, we took out all these mineral slabs, uh, made some stabilize, so water again can go in the water uh, in the in the soil. Then we have a green cooling island, um, like 1.5 hectare of new green uh, arbust, um, like shrubs and perennials, and also the water management in this sector. On the left, the new housing and urban gardens. And on the right, uh, the relics of the old um, silk production plant. The main thing was to create like a canopy, because there, uh, where this, the Esplanade were now, were all little sheds which could not be kept. And so we tried to transform these uh, architectural sheds into a green new structure, a green new roof, green canopy. So this is what it looks today and uh, it's uh, been renovated, it's been transformed in office buildings and thank God to the initiative of the residents we have this entrance area now which is a park public entrance area, otherwise it could have happened that we have car parking like in the far background. And that was also the former entrance through these gates. So to the other side are the little houses, the structure of the workers of the, fa uh, of the factory and this little cafes and bars and whatsoever. 
So you come in, in the site, there was this gateway, and we thought, what can we do with this gateway? Uh, it was all concrete uh, ceiling and whatsoever, so we decided to transform it in a golden ceiling, make it a really new aesthetic uh, dialogue with the site, and so it's very popular, people want to protect it and that's the reason why they leave it open only for pedestrians. They are afraid scooters could go in and um, therefore it's, it's, um, there's this gate structure. To the other side, the access goes to the water tower and um, along the facade is the, the plantations uh, of the Esplanade where it started. The Metropole Lyon has a program uh, for which is very important to integrate schools in the awareness of um, uh, climate change and that uh, we need to, to, from early age on, kids should understand how important it is to have a green environment which is adapted to the climate. And so here the pupils of the Colette um, Carriot School were integrated in the first plantings. This is how the Esplanade looks uh, today. For sure, a company planted other trees in total. We have 200, uh, 260 trees now, and it's become a very lively place. We understood sustainability as an asset and not a constraint. Uh, in the side street, there is um, 330 square meters uh, of a residence organization called Potashi en Soi, uh, where people meet, teach each other, celebrate together, garden together. And so for us, it was very important that all this new habitat can also touch on the ground, come here, uh, use the open space whenever they want, and um, maybe not own it, but use it. Uh, this is uh, the final outcome. We established like a long picnic table uh, for all sorts of events to take place, and um, it's really well used, and people even used it before it was opened. So there was a re really big drive to, to open the site. And um, as you see in the background, we also integrated art in the public space, like in um, the Turin project. We had made this experience, this can work, and it's also implemented here. So further structures, introducing water for kids uh, was very important since it's getting really, really hot in the summertime in, um, in Lyon. And also the people were just, uh, the kids were just using uh, all the, the playground things before there was even an official opening. To close the site behind the water tower, uh, we uh, introduced um, a ramped earth wall with uh, niches to have more intimate spaces where there's also these golden elements we've seen in the pathway and creating a new dialogue with the whole context around the water tower. Um, here again to show you from how do you do this transition to the public space because just behind is the public road and um, and the tram line connecting to the airport and to the city center. So to close the site, we thought this was a good south-facing way to leave the view open, but at the same time give some definition. On the other side of the construction building were equally uh, these production sheds. Um, we could only keep the one behind the orange walls. and. Uh, the Metropole Lyon decided to transform it into a parking. So equally on this side, you see that there's only concrete slabs, mineral, no open ground. And the process of transformation was there to decide to cut into this uh, concrete structure, take it out, crush it, fill it in with a uh, fertile soil and put new plants in small size so they can really adapt to the local situation. 
So on the back where there's this square, there was another part of the building which was destructed, but it's all painted in this rusty orange. Uh, the pathways for the workers were also in orange and then, since it's a parking, we had to find a way to give orientation where people can walk. And so we decided to continue this orange from the wall also in the walkway layer. So finally, this transition from uh, demolition has come to a new aesthetic, a new definition um, of open soil and walkway. Also, the symbols with the numbers uh, give some sort of new lecture of the site, new combination, new dialogue of the existing. Some facades have been painted in blue and dark grey to redefine the space. Uh, to show you, so the plants are really small, giving a process to, to start a vegetation process. And this is the one of the sheds which is kept. In here, the Metropole de Lyon has uh, inserted um, a group called uh, Audas, and they offer for young people the possibility to get uh, a formation of bicycle repair. They can work there and can just exchange. So give it a new, new room. All in all, we have 2.8 hectares of new public space in reused industrial architectural elements and there's no significant misuses up to now, no graffitis, no whatsoever. So we interpret this as a sign of acceptance and people are quite happy with this sort of transformation. S leaving Lyon, uh, we come to Belleval which is an uh, industrial site, uh, steel work, um, and it's been transformed in 2000, or starting in 2001. Um, Joe Conan won the master plan. It's uh, located uh, on two territories, uh, Esch sur Elsert and Zanem, and it's a total size of 170 football fields. So we work uh, on this green circular area. The northern part has already been transformed. There was a national investment program to transform this northern part. Uh, there's the university, there's uh, cultural institutions, housing, uh, event areas, and the landscape has been done by Michel de Vigne. Uh, the southern part is only these two holes of the Sinterpeck and it's the only thing left of the former industrial plant and therefore there's a big um, public awareness of what is going to happen with these two holes. So for them it's like a, a major heritage issue since it's only these two holes left um, that they're not get lost in a way. This past does not get lost. Um, we have in total the 100% transformation from industrial surface to new urban district with a functional mix of living, working, studying and going out, despite you see only a car parking here, but it's already taking shape in a 3D dimension. Here you see again the overall situation and um, as I said, it's Patrimoine Industriel National uh, with big focus on it. So we started the competition in 2018 uh, together with Metaform Architects and HLG Engineers. This is what we found on site. Uh, massive concrete structures um, uh, you should better not demolish because um, in terms of uh, carbon footprint uh, it's better to reuse and to find a new way to deal with it uh, and to, to pre uh, then to just uh, voila, preserve it or to, to knock it down. 
Um, here, this was the competition. They made an expect uh, um, exposition on the car park. Um, and uh, a lot of local people were interested in what is going to happen to their patrimoine um, national. This is what was the uh, outcome of the competition, uh, which was a two-phase competition. We were nearly kicked out in first phase because the architect thought it should be really a mineral loop. And we were saying, no, we have to really, really think about the, uh, the layer, uh, vegetation layer in this complex situation. We deal here with a... Um, level of nine meters of, uh, of difference. Uh, so also it's not so easy to find plants which really adapt to this. Um, and it's a connection between new sectors of housing, new urban situation. And uh, so these were the competition perspectives. For sure it will not be uh, like this, but this gives you a spatial idea of it, what is the relation between green aspects, public square, and um, cafe area. So in the minus nine level, uh, is the idea is to have a cafe and a restaurant. We still haven't found uh, um, the, the people to, to do it. Um, but the Agora, who is our client, is very um, hopeful that we can continue the project with this uh, restaurant cafe idea. And then we have on the, we are standing on the ramp now, and we, um, ah, no, I have to go back, excuse me. Uh, we have the sort of amphitheater situation in the background, and then on top, on a level which is three meters higher than the current car parking, we have the urban square. This is the situation, the industrial relic we find today. There is no water in at the moment. And so we plan uh, like a milieu ve végétal uh, on three layers. And this has to be established over time. So the residents are very interested in how this can happen, how we can transform something really hard and mineral industrial heritage into some public garden, uh, water garden. Here you see uh, that also the two Sinterbecken is a layer on top of a natural layer because when we discuss now it's like all in research at the moment uh, with our clients and they have uh, integrated experts that before these two Sinterbergens were established there was some sort of a back, some water surface and now this water surface makes rises the water. So it's uh, rising in unpredicted situation. Sometimes it rises, sometimes it falls. And this is what we have to calculate now in the project. We have to find like cisterns where we can have an overflow. And so our conversations are always in, in different layers uh, of, of thinking. Yeah. Also between the, in, the engineers, architecture and us, we, we are all uh, touching on new ground here. So we, we plan to uh, rise the level of the existing walls for three meters uh, in brick and keep the concrete below as it is and then introduce in the lower levels a water garden which you cannot access in the layer one, an urban plaza in brick which you can access for all sorts of functions and then uh, on top uh, like uh, an urban square with lively edges. These are our current studies. We're still uh, we're still developing this milieu végétal, uh, also with our client and the Commune de Sanem. It's a work in progress, and so here we hope to realize 7,000 square meters of new public space on three levels in this industrial heritage context. 
to finish, I want to present you the pro project Paco Dorospina in Turin, which is a project of Peter and Tilman Latz. Um, and here we have a now a situation of an intra-urban industrial wasteland transformed into a, a new park, 37 hectares in the middle of the city center. It's the former um, Michelin and uh, Fiat uh, factories, which are uh, border bordering to the Dora River. And um, in this plan, you can see that uh, part of the Dora River is closed, and it was an international competition in 2004. The idea was to also open this part. It has not happened yet, but uh, we are hopeful that in the city of Turin will do this in one of the next steps. So equally here, the aim was to give new public space in existing architectural structures, which um, we didn't want to add, but we wanted to reinterpret and re use also the existing material qualities which, which were just there. So, for example, this roof in itself uh, gives shelter in summer, in the hot summers, in winter, in rain. Um, it's already a spatial quality, already being like this, just taking out the side walls and uh, giving a new conception to this, uh, to this hall, to this structure. So below you see what was the conception and uh, this is how it looks today. Uh, it's a new aesthetic, it's sort of an odd uh, thing. You would have probably never uh, imagined it like this, but this is the combination of existing elements and uh, new ideas, like for example, we keep all the rainwater of architectural structure, try to use it, um, have an own irrigation system, collect it, uh, connect the, the new park to the uh, mountains, to the new residential areas, and uh, integrate art as or temporary art exhibitions on the surfaces which are already there. And this is also an idea we have retaken in TAS. It works really well. Then we try to give uh, these uh, concrete blocks a new uh, idea of um, using them for um, children playground, but also this, there was no money to realize it. Maybe in a second phase, it can be done. Then, as I said, the water collection is a very important uh, aspect for, for this park. And so here, we just for the students to remember, the parameters I told you in the beginning, reuse and upcycling of architectural elements in open structure is very important in combination with urban sustainability and climate adapted spaces and the circularity to transform it into new aesthetic places what all sorts of actions can happen today. Then we had these building structures in concrete. We took out the roofs and also this is now uh, open for urban gardening for kids to, to use for, for vegetable and all sorts of things and just to respect the bare quality of the mater material. Then we had uh, other architectural elements we uh, wanted to reuse for uh, for water systems, for cisterns to retain the rainwater, and also to reshape the edges of this Dora River um, connected to the new uh, residential areas. So here the idea was to give also these uh, columns in steel a new function. We connected it with a bridge uh, structure, like a, an elevated uh, platform. You can look on the side and see uh, the new water landscapes on the ground. Um, and all sorts of new events happened. 
This was in the inauguration uh, day. And here you see how we took out uh, the upper architectural walls to use what is left, the basement, as water cistern. Here again. And so the realization, we cannot always have total control over the realization because we work with local partners and they do sometimes things we would have done differently if we had full control of whatsoever, but this is not the world you have to share. Yeah, so here was the idea for the area of the closed um, part of the Dora River. We wanted to open it also having this idea of um, these galleries going through, but this is also a part which has not been realized yet. We hope that it will be, uh, will be realized soon. In terms of plan and section, this is what has come out of this combination, transformation of the existing to, to this new park. And I am sure it's an aesthetic you could have never planned uh, on a white paper. This is one of the special things we, we think are important, that you look what is there, you work with what is there, and you find a new way to transform it in a new sense of meaning, a new public space. And so it's a great, a great hall for all sorts of things which can change daily. So people can come whenever, uh, all sorts of function can happen. People of all ages, all types of societies can come and, and do whatever they want. And um, we think it's a great advantage for Turin that um, whatever is an urban stage for what you want. 37 hectares of new public space and also spontaneous rooms within the room, the temporariness, which can give quality for, for youth or other events. Yeah, so thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Such a fantastic project. Uh, it's really one of the best parks I've ever visited. <coughs> um, so we have um, a short break now. So, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a refreshing coffee in the sun. Uh, we will continue now with our last speaker. But first, I would like to uh, encourage our audience to uh, put down questions. And you use the, the Menti um, site with the code, uh, because that's really important that you're also part of, of, of the panel that we will have directly after our last speaker. Uh, and also for you who are in the room, uh, we can also pose the question. But we've noticed that maybe, uh, well, the, the uh, Menti uh, side is quite important that you use as well. So, I'm now very happy to introduce our last speaker, uh, Kevin Daly, uh, who's the founder of uh, Kevin Daly Architects, uh, who received his Bachelor of Architecture from the University of California. Berkeley College of Environmental Design, and he got his master from the Rice University School of Architecture. Over his 30-year career, he has defined uh, a design process that upholds the practical magic of architecture, an alchemical conjunction of craft, materials and form. Bolstered by abundant research, he has demonstrated the benefits of advanced, unconventional building technology in works that are consistently recognized in publications and awards, and range from public schools, custom residences and university buildings to affordable housing. Daly is particularly recognized for reclaiming and transforming sites characteristic of the post-war city, turning generic background buildings 
into models of community identity. Dahlia has established a critical practice that is nationally recognized and simultaneously engages the profession as well as the local community. He held distinguished university chairs at Berkeley and Michigan and is a regular faculty member at the UCLA. And directly more or less from Los Angeles or via New York, Kevin Daly, please give him a warm hand. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for the invitation, um, and th really thank you so much for the opportunity to join you here. Um, Lund, uh, I, we were talking about this last night, kind of figured prominently our kids, our family lived here for a little while. I didn't, because I had to go back and forth, but um, w it really is, a, is kind of a, a favored place in our family and our family's memories. Um, I'll show a half dozen projects. Um, I think our... Our office does kind of public buildings, housing, and you know workplaces. But if you talk to the people in the office, what they think is that we do housing, and so those are they're the kind of favored projects um, in the office. And I and so what I thought I would do is talk about how housing, you know, within our kind of limited experience, has kind of transformed, you know, just recently in Los Angeles, um, and. Um, we, um, in Los Angeles, in the U.S., and, and, and I think to some degree um, in, you know, maybe here in southern Scandinavia also, are just really facing a huge housing crisis. Um, and, uh, and I want you to think about that as kind of a, a way to connect what's going on here and the kind of long tradition of social housing here to, you know, the, what's going, what, what we're thinking about in Los Angeles. And there are a lot of undergraduates here. I hope that I can convince you to consider applying to UCLA or SciArc and joining us um, and kind of immersing yourself in the Los Angeles architecture scene for graduate school. Um, it is a really robust architecture kind of uh, world there, uh, like, like there is here. Um, but ours is on the Pacific Ocean, and it's surrounded by the Santa Monica Mountains. So it, it just may be worth considering. Um, so, um, and, I, and the other kind of connection between Los Angeles and here, um, the, you know, I really wanted to kind of think about this idea of, of, of re-engaging architecture and architectures in general. And in Los Angeles, that really means kind of re-engaging an urban fabric that I love Los Angeles, um, but I have to acknowledge it was hastily, extensively, and, and kind of in some cases thoughtlessly built. And so any work within that city is really about reconsidering a lot of decisions and a lot of you know, construction that has been, that was made in the past. Um, per Johan uh, was a, I think we met when you were visiting Los Angeles and at UCLA. Some of the work that was done then by Per Johan and by UCLA City Lab really has been seminal in how we've started to think about different aspects of architecture as well, especially housing. Um, so I think that that idea of kind of reactivating is really central to how we've, started to take on ideas about architecture, ideas about housing, and, and I think what I'll try to convince you of is that um, housing is um, the solutions involving housing and density in Los Angeles are increasingly small solutions. Um, and I think small and tactical solutions with a bigger strategy are the conclusions we've reached lately. Um, you can see this image here. Um, kind of right near my house, um, and I'm sure you've seen news footage of the kind of the crisis of the unhoused in Los Angeles currently. Um, this is a photo from New York Times. They always are looking for ways of kind of heaping scorn on California. So, you know, it's, uh, there's always this kind of undertone of like, it's a great place, but they have the earthquakes and the fires, and now all these people are living in tents. 
But the, the fact of the matter is, this is a more commonplace experience than any of us would like to admit. There's kind of a shocking indifference to, to the kind of condition of the unhoused. You can see a couple of people playing golf right next to this encampment. Just off this picture, and I know this neighborhood because it's, it's right nearby, um, Frank Gehry designed a house for one of the LA artists, I think maybe John Baldessari, <clears throat> just off this photo. Um, and so, you know, we've, it's kind of gotten to the point where it's so routine that it's hard to see, and, and then it's also equally hard to forget. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's one of these things that um, engages ideas about funding, historical, you know, sort of, pro you know, historical trends in lending, who can borrow money and who can buy real estate. And generally in the past 40 or 50 years, it's been pretty much white people. And that's had a big effect on the kind of form of our city. So um, I think... You know, I think this idea of the kind of everydayness of um, of work and recreation and other kinds of residential conditions right next to kind of unhoused conditions is something that we are all kind of struggling to kind of to 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 set right. Um, and a lot of that lately has been this kind of huge. Um, kind of phenomenon of, of gentrification in Los Angeles. And so this, um, I remember when we first moved to LA, one of the few places you could go to watch like the Euro Cup was this bar here in Highland Park. Very stable, kind of mostly Latinx community um, that's been, that's had a huge, uh, there's, there's been a huge impact of gentrification on this neighborhood and um, it was very stable. People have slowly been pushed out. Um, the, uh, the Greyhound, I think, is now owned by a restaurant group that has a Michelin star chef. Um, so the kind of economic push um, of, of that kind of gentrification is something that's really significant in the city. Um, and I think, you know, and I was thinking about this this morning during the talks, you know, seeing gentrification as a form of displacement is a, is a way of seeing both, you know, everybody involved as being kind of impacted by this kind of negative consequence of, you know, of the kind of fluidity and economic consequence basically of real estate prices and, and the unavailability of housing. Um, so I think we need to see gentrification not as a linear process of real estate values increasing, but as kind of a form of dislocation that's affecting neighborhoods that are being left by people and and being pushed and pushing other people out. Um, this has only been been made worse from you know during the pandemic because more affluent people and mostly in the tech sector have been able to move to other parts of the country. And so really what's happened is that it's you know, the necessity to work from home made it so you could work from anywhere. And um, people in the technology sector started leaving expensive cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, and LA is probably, I think it is the most expensive city based on housing per salary and in the country. So what's happened is the people with the highest incomes have been able to leave. And the people that are generally in the service sector have just really been forced to kind of stay and deal with higher housing costs all the time. Um, and, and really what we've done is take this problem, I feel like I finally got that job at a call center, um, it, is just kind of export the problem all across our country. And so now the most expensive, you know, the highest kind of change in value in real estate are in small cities like Boise, Idaho, and Spokane, Washington, and Austin, Texas. And so really all we're doing is taking the people that are, have the sort of economic means in Los Angeles and San Francisco and pushing out the people in Spokane and, uh, and Boise and Austin from the kind of real estate options and housing opportunities that, are, that have been previously existing in those cities. Um, so... It's, you know, it's obviously, a, a, you know, a huge problem. Um, I thought I'd show you some examples of how we got involved in designing housing. Um, 
it hasn't really been that a long, long of a trajectory for us. And um, it's kind of, you know, and it's, our work is really focused on affordable housing and workforce housing. There's no real social housing in the U.S. It's generally considered a function of a fraction of the median income, and that sets the kind of overall rent. So it's a slightly different economic factor, but generally it's a, it's a 60 to 80 percent of median income that, that sets the rent uh, for affordable housing. Um, our first project in housing, we were contacted by a housing activist who'd seen some of the charter schools we designed. <clears throat> and um, I don't know, with not a very good instinct about business development, you know, we kind of, I declined and said, look, you know, I know this is a specialty. And, you know, we saw just in Soren's talk, you know, people spend 50 years learning how to do housing and maybe you should go talk to one of them. And, um, and she really kind of called us out on it and said, you know, you're, you're doing these charter schools, you think it's urban work, but it's not. You know, urban work in Los Angeles is about housing, and it always has been. Irving Gill, you know, Richard Neutra, Sch Schindler, the case study program, it's always about housing. And if any of you have visited California and seen, you know, on the glide path, and, and it just seems like L.A. is kind of going on for, you know, like, it's like 15 minutes as you're going into LAX. Her position was that that was really just a function of housing. And, and that grid filled with housing is really just about allowing those houses to be connected to everything else. And so the, you know, this kind of narrative of the kind of fundamental architectural project in Los Angeles is housing was one that, that you know, I found really compelling and really convincing. Um, so, um, and we started, I think like a lot of architects, you know, okay, what are the typologies we're looking at here? And started looking at the dingbats of, you know, that I, I would say of LA, but really they kind of go all the way out to Houston, Texas. The kind of idea of these very simple frame buildings, over parking, you know, what are the kind of typological issues behind that? And, um, and, and started kind of thinking, all right, well, if we, took something like this dingbat and, and snipped it, snipped away at it and broke it into components, you know, what are we going to end up with? And um, part of our conversation with her, this woman, Joan Ling, was, you know, I, I kind of said, look, the reason I'm kind of reluctant about housing is we've already done these charter schools where you know, it's like everything comes, it's, you feel like you're paying it out of your own pocket. You know, the budgets are so tight and I don't want to be involved in like this race to the bottom. So, you know, how about a deal? We want one performance facade for the building. You know, one kind of component of the building that has, to, that has to do a lot of architectural work. And most of that work is really about sustainability, kind of environmental performance and shading and, and kind of getting it organized with respect to the world around it. <clears throat> and then, you know... And then once that surface, we wanted that to give that a slight kind of geometric twist so that it wasn't just light falling on the flat wall. So as we started looking at this, and you can see with the red square, that's the building. At that time, there was a huge amount of, you know, um, just pushback from the neighborhood. You know, I, we really believe in affordable housing, but we have too much of it in our neighborhood, and we're like no one can afford to live in your neighborhood. You know, there isn't too much of it anywhere in Southern California. Um, but really had to document, they, they you know, uh, filed, you know, objections to every approval we got, and we had to kind of demonstrate that we were building the same thing that already existed in their neighborhood. Very contentious process. But here's where it started to kind of take the shape of this kind of single performance facade. And what, really, what we really did was kind of develop this single block and just rotate it 90 degrees so that the performance side always was facing the most sun exposure. That let us shade the building really effectively. It let us keep the units really open and, and, and they really can get by just with natural ventilation. So that's the kind of strategy there. You can see each of the facades changes slightly. The geometry of those window boxes changes slightly, in, whether it's oriented west or east or south. 
and um, and then just kind of took those blocks and pushed them out to the kind of perimeter of the site. And once you do that, you also can see that you need that kind of weird sort of Gumby-shaped thing connecting it all back together. And I think with respect to landscape, we found a way to cut a donut hole all the way through the parking. So we were able to put these gigantic sycamore trees right in the middle of this courtyard. And so now you can start to see what some of the impl implications of that are. We use this kind of screen. And what happens is that people look in the courtyard through their glass, through this wooden screen, through the sycamores, through another wooden screen, and really develop a huge amount of privacy across this courtyard that lets people feel like they can keep their windows much more open and, and really just kind of develop a lot of privacy. And, and with that privacy comes, comes openness. Um, you can see here, this is the kind of blue facade is this kind of performance facade. Then the brown is just kind of much more conventional concrete board. And so Joan Ling's joke was she had hired us to do mostly affordable housing. So we had three facades that were really economical and one that was a little bit more expensive. Um, and so here's the corner of it. You can see these kind of applied windows pushed into the facade. We really tried to organize the facade so you couldn't read which floor levels were which, and it just kind of was a little more activated. Um, these are the kind of screens. You know, the, the sycamores now are just are up over the kind of top level of the, tr of the buildings. Um, so that was like kind of, that was our initial project. Um, it took probably five years to build, huge number of community meetings, um, and built 30 units. So, you know, the kind of payoff of architectural effort per, on a per unit basis was pretty low. By the time we started Gramercy, um, things had changed a lot in Los Angeles. Um, this is a project that's 100% affordable. 100% uh, elderly and 50% formerly homeless. Uh, and <clears throat> when we went to the community meetings for that, we were kind of thinking, all right, this is like a bad combination of qualities we have to pitch to this community. And, and I think politically things have changed a lot in Los Angeles. And people were kind of like, well, if the lady who sleeps on the sofa in my alley can get a unit, I'm all for it. And there was just a much different sort of political vibe altogether. Um, this um, had some of the same financing as the other, but in this particular case, the land was owned by the city. They made a huge effort to turn everything they owned into housing. Um, the county and the city both passed bonds of a billion dollars. Some of that money went into this project. It was about, it took about half the amount of time as the other, um, but you know, still, and I, it's, I think it's a really beautiful project, um, and it was, it was kind of like two-thirds the amount of time, twice the number of units, but still we're not making a very big dent, you know, on the, on the number of units that are needed. Um, I, since there are students here, I thought you'd like this. When I'm talking to students, I'm always talking about how, you know, it, it's essential that you inhabit your own project. You, you, you have to live and you have to, you know, you have to, you know, be able to, be able to inhabit the spaces you're designing. But no one inhabits them as much as this kid in our office. And you can see he took photos of the scale figures and then made a series of family portraits because he didn't want them to, to be alone. Um, but we make a lot of models, uh, study everything in models. Uh, you know, I think for us, that's a really essential, that's the kind of lingua franca of, you know, when, when you're looking at a model and your client is, you know, you're just seeing the same thing. Um, so that really is an essential part at multiple scales for everything we do. Here's the finished project, broken into a series of components, um, pushed, pushed aside each that gave a, us a way to connect it all with a walkway. Each of those walkways made a bridge. That bridge got wide enough so each person had an outdoor space that faced the walkways so that they could engage their neighbors and, and kind of be in a public way. And you can see here, these are some of the exteriors, kind of this extensive um, trellis system that makes outdoor rooms where everyone can hang out without being you know, really in the sun. 
Um, so that project's just finished, and I think I'll show you two others that really quickly, as mainly just as kind of different strategies. So this um, is a project that we worked on with UC Berkeley. You know, it's the best public university in the country, and and they're starting to run into a situation where the graduate students they were trying to recruit were just going to secondary schools because they couldn't afford to live in the Bay Area. And so this kind of took on a much different kind of urgency. Um, they uh, had kind of a public-private partnership. They hired a developer who brought an architect and um, that was their kind of stra that was their way to kind of speed the process along and change the f nature of the financing, except the building was horrible. And so they kind of, they brought us in and we kind of reconfigured things and said, look, we just have to get some outdoor space. You know, it has to face the bay. We have to be able to see things. And so we just kind of kept working on it with them. Pretty awkward shotgun marriage for about the first two months, but I think everyone's happy now. Um, and really just started breaking these things down and kind of giving them a different kind of scale and giving it kind of a street presence and, and a, a kind of way to be kind of a part of this neighborhood. And you can kind of see this existing set of buildings over to the right, um, you know, a 1980s kind of traditional thing. And so really what we tried to do is take that scale and just start assembling it and using it as blocks to kind of make the massing of our building um, and give that the kind of, give it kind of a pest, pedestrian scale by doing that and obviously has sort of like a you know, pretty weird muscular set of massing conditions, but that's the kind of project it is too. Um, the next one is a project for um, it, it, the biggest, one of the biggest corporations in the country, Walt, Walmart. This is the Walton Family Foundation. Um, and uh, they likewise, have, you know, even in small towns like Bentonville, Arkansas, you know, have this huge housing problem. And really what was happening is people were building further and further out and getting in a car to come into this small town of Bentonville and kind of ruining the qualities of the city. So they had a big international competition organized by uh, Peter McKeith uh, at the University of Arkansas. We won one of the sites, kind of developed this, developed it as kind of a, a cross name at a timber building. They're really trying to reestablish the timber industry in Arkansas. Um, and, and so this was this idea about making about 300 units, what they, what they were calling this was attainable housing. So they set the kind of the value of the rent at the level of one third of the household income. Um, it's right next to uh, Crystal Bridges Museum a, a new contemporary art museum. And right after we won it, they decided they had to do something else. And so the project took a much different shape. Here it is now. You can see the, the Crystal Bridges Museum is off in the background. That kind of weird, bumpy thing is a, is a music venue. And so basically, this makes the back wall sort of like the, the back of La Scala of this kind of big outdoor venue. So... We really kind of tried to develop that with the, these kind of acoustical properties that also gave the people living there so this really direct view into the into the venue itself. You can kind of see here that the kind of surface of the building had to have this kind of active acoustical quality. This is an artist artist housing project, um, and you know some of these same characteristics of these very kind of transparent and screen like vertical circulation systems with a much more kind of highly regulated sort of housing block. Um, so, um, let's see, my text is all mixed up. So then um, I'll show you a few images of this by home and this is kind of where Per Johan started his work. This was some of the kind of early work that uh, City Lab was doing with additional dwelling units. Um, and just so I don't forget to say this at the end of the talk, I think one of the things, oh, this project was kind of like, 
this was a it was a student project or a student kind of it was a student executed project that I led as a as a tech seminar, and we kind of said, all right, let's take this very small footprint idea of a building that goes in a backyard and it has to go in any backyard. And you know, I think at the time it was a little bit of a provocation, and we and and I my sense was like, all right, this is you know, what do you want to do with this as students? What do you want to get out of this? And 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 really, what we tried to do is start to say, you know, there are already tons of like little pre-made buildings you can order at the back of magazines. How are we going to make this different? And 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 one of the things we really started to look at was this kind of Buckminster Fuller like sort of strategy. You know, you know, madam, do you know how much your house weighs? What are the implications of, of doing that? Because as architects, we're never really going to be able to build our way out of the environmental crisis we have. And and really, one of the only ways to take it on, and we're certainly not going to do it by putting like more sustainable flooring in. So what we try to do is say, all right, how how minimal can we make this? And how much can we reduce the mass of this? Not simply to make it light, but really just by changing the sort of material intensity of the entire effort. And so what we're showing here is this idea that, you know, a conventional building, you can see the kind of abbreviated stats there in terms of weight and in terms of, um, you know, kind of overall building intensity, we were kind of aiming to make it at about a tenth of what a conventional building would be. But by doing that, you order you that order of magnitude turns into two orders of magnitude in reduction of environmental kind of consequence of producing and refining and shipping materials, and it also makes it so a building like this wouldn't need a concrete foundation. You know, the one of the biggest liabilities we have as architects. So this was this very light frame building, you know, tube frame. You can see it's a kind of a diagrid frame building. The idea was that. Um, if we imagined it as two skins of ETFE with a spacer in between that could really kind of direct and control sunlight, we could build lighting into that. That space became some became a space that was held together with a partial vacuum. So that partial vacuum actually has very good insulating insulating qualities. Um, I think I couldn't get this one to play, um, but student built in like three weeks. Um, but it had really beautiful sort of light qualities and, and really kind of, you know, this kind of sense that, that there was this kind of boundary between you and the rest of the world, but still a huge amount of, of kind of, I don't know, I wouldn't even call it privacy, but just this sort of, you know, making this kind of the, the envelope between you and the rest of the world into this kind of metaphysical thing that's, it's, it was everything that was neither inside or not, nor outside. Um, if you go to high school uh, in Korea and then graduate from UCLA, you have to wear your high school uniform to graduation. So this is graduation week. Um, but here's the kind of scale of it. We built it in one of the courtyards at the school. Um, it was up for a summer. But I think the reason why it's significant as this kind of provocation um, is because later that became the basis for really substantial legislative, le legislative change in, in the state. And so first they introduced an ADU law that made it so that it was illegal for cities to prohibit the construction of ADUs, which cities like Santa Monica routinely did, or they would add parking requirements or make it so there would be an administrative hurdle that was po impossible to cross. Um, but more recently, City Lab helped author a state law that says, not only can you build an ADU, you can subdivide a residential property. And each of those subdivisions can have an ADU. So it takes single family house lots and makes it so there's a potential of four units. In Los Angeles, there's a half a million single family lots. So the kind of capacity to build you know, that many more units was kind of built into this really simple state law. And I think, you know, and I think things like a little buy home prototype contributes to that really directly. So I'll show you this project. This um, 
was a, it's a small project. It was designed for kids coming out of foster care. Um, so really, you know, I don't know, kids who've never had a piece of furniture, you know, no family to support them. And so we <clears throat> started taking this on and thinking, well, you know, let's find a way to make it so that there is no vertical transportation. These are all just small units. And let's use every inch of the site, just every square inch, and really kind of prioritize the kind of site coverage. And the way to do that also meant simultaneously we had to really watch the footprint and make the smallest possible footprint we could. So you can see each of these things has, um, and they kind of fit together like puzzle pieces, each has a lower level, a stair up to a sleeping loft, um, and then an outdoor terrace. Total privacy and total security, those are the kinds of things that the kids we talked to said were most important to them. Um, and you can kind of see each of these things could, you know, we were kind of imagining they could take on sort of a architectural life of their own. And then what we tried to do is really just recapture all the space between these blocks. And you can see those spaces became the kind of shared spaces and the kind of cladding of the building just kind of runs right past and it just becomes like a greenhouse-like space. This is shared kitchens and living rooms and things like that. Um, and really just kind of made this kind of, I don't know, scale of a little city um, all its own. And that really became an important part of how we started thinking about this next project. The last one I'll show you, um, low rise housing. Um, this was a competition that the city of LA put on um, to start to address the, the fact that there really weren't resources for building the amount of housing. I think there's a 250,000 unit deficit in the city. Um, and so we, entered this competition, the people in the office who got really into it and really were excited about it. And, um, and so here's, here's why the kind of low-rise housing issue makes sense, because those orange dots are areas where the city's identified potential for boulevard development. These green dots are transit corridors where they allow higher density and little, you know, minimal parking requirements. Um, but those things together still don't add up to 15,000 units. And, and the problem is that each of those projects gets larger and larger, and they run into more and more political opposition. And so the conclusion was, and then these are these little tiny orange dots you can barely see there. Those are the large lots that are available left in the city, because like I said, it's kind of extensively built, but not very well thought out. But then when you start looking at the number of spaces that are single family homes or R2 zones, this is the kind of logic. This is where you start getting the numbers and the kind of order of magnitude that really changes, that can change the equation for the development of housing. We started looking at historically, um, the kinds of housing strategies and really these, you, you know, the kind of underlying issue here is it's, it's kind of, a, these are indica indications of housing and landscape strategies. And really what we tried to do was kind of go back to, you know, about a hundred years to the bungalow courts where like that, you know, little, little Berkeley project, each small building had a relationship to the site and had a really direct relationship to the exterior. And I think what, one of the things that's really happened is, is as housing types have changed in Los Angeles, we've also severed it from the landscape around it, which is really one of the kind of primary characteristics of why people like to live in Los Angeles. The other you know, kind of paradoxical issue is that around Los Angeles, rents range you know, by like 160%. And so, and there's not going to be any way to change that. Um, and these are kind of old numbers. You know, now at one bedroom in Brentwood for $2,400 would probably seem like a pretty good deal. Um, so as we started thinking about this, we kind of realized that those rent levels had to be reflected in the kind of cost of the development of, of each of these units. And that really had to be managed through scale, 
making footprints smaller and finishes because even though rents vary all across the region, construction costs don't. So basically it costs the same to build in the very cheapest neighborhood as it does in the most expensive neighborhood. And so you, you know, as architects, we have to kind of take that on, take that paradox on. And, and so this is this idea that you might be able to do a very stripped down version and, and let, you know, pe let pieces get added on and let finishes change and, and, uh, and let the kind of overall footprint be constrained. Um, so this is this idea that of this, you know, single lot that can now hold four units and really trying to find ways of reestablishing the landscape connection to each of those units. Um, and you can kind of see here as two, as two lots get pushed together, one of the other configurations was, um, was this idea that you could put eight together and really start to make kind of a park-like setting. Our sense was that you had to use the exterior wall of your neighbor for outdoor rooms. And so those started to kind of add, you know, figure really prominently into how we started thinking about this. But you can start to see how these things kind of both stand out and fit into the existing neighborhood. And you can also imagine that you might be able to add just one of those blocks, one little tower. And so here are some of the kind of initial renderings that were part of the competition. And I'll just kind of click through these really quickly. Um, and just take a couple minutes to explain. This is maybe a little bit too nerdy. But in the US, especially in California, it's very hard to build anything prefabricated, especially small scale projects. Because what the cities do, what the kind of regulatory agencies do, is they require you to have a plan check set for the part that's built in the factory and a different one for the part that's built, anything built on the site. So all the site improvements and foundations and things like that. So for a small project, you've just immediately doubled the kind of administrative burden of your project. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the kind of cost savings of, of prefabrication is hard, to, is hard to capture in the US. What they are willing to do is pre-certify things like specific building components. And so big companies, like hardware companies, um, will test design and then test things like that frame that that guy's putting in. Kind of a, a you can see that's a structural, a shear wall component that helps stiffen up the, you know, that takes the, sh you know, the kind of lateral force for this part of the building. And they've also done it for kind of much larger pieces, like, you know, whole moment frames and moment frame assemblies and things like that. And basically when you use those, you take that test data, your engineer does, and the city just accepts it and doesn't require any further inspections or anything like that. So as we started thinking about the kind of implications of this low rise project, what we started realizing is, you know, these things really are built, you know, as kind of a series of layers and this idea that you could build with a, t a really tiny footprint and make kind of a tower, like, you know, an Italian medieval city. Um, but it always it came, it kept coming back to this idea of what was at the kind of very core of it. And so what we're trying to do now is take this very central core, this yellow part, as a series of cross laminated timber panels that we are engineering and working with a manufacturer to test at the big structure lab at UC San Diego. And the objective is to make that entire structure into a single building component, just like those steel things we saw in the you know, Simpson strong frames. And so then you can start to imagine, you know, not just in Los Angeles, but really anywhere across the country, you could take that test data and, and as long as it was fabricated and installed correctly, it would be no different than, um, than any other kind of pre-approved uh, manufactured system. So as we started thinking about this low rise issue, we also kind of realized that there had to be a way to kind of implement it in a kind of an incremental way. And, and the thing that's interesting to me about this is it starts to shift the sort of economic clout of the project away from banks and away from developers and into people who own a little house. 
and and being able to do that and generate rent from three units while you live in one really does fundamentally change the equation and change how things might work in Los Angeles. So, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Really interesting. And uh, we should now... Uh, I ask you to stay here because we're now uh, having our second panel discussion. So, Iris, please come up with us. And also, per you one. Um, <laughs> I stand here on the edge, <laughs> if you need me. Yeah. So, as you know, um, Sargon had to leave. So, uh, and we thought it was interesting to seeing sometimes the, the year we had the similar questions that Kevin discussed and seeing that in a Danish version. But we have all shared what uh, Sargon told us. So, questions you have from that, I'm sure that we can bring them up uh, here to, to the panel discussion too. Uh, so, we were thinking, Elin and I, yeah, because Elin, you, first I'm, I have to ask you, have we got any questions from Not the students? Yet. No. So, if any of you have any questions, please just raise your hand. Yes. Should we just start with a question, actually? I think that would be good, wouldn't it? Yes, we have not? a question over here. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, Søren talks about the, um, a kind of um, uh, uh, renovating problem, and uh, she talks about a, a rejuvenation process um, in order to keep the already existing projects and structures in shape. Uh, what do you think have to change in order to make that happen? Is it a uh, uh, simply a bureaucracy problem, uh, a problem of uh, accountability, uh, like like a long-term accountability of, of the things we built, or um, is there is, is there another form of solution to this? To be a more, to look at it more proactively than just uh, uh, fixing it with renovation and fixing it with rejuvenation. How can we be proactive? Yeah. Is it so that you want us to repeat the question for recording? Yes. yes. So the question is, uh, is the way forward is it, uh, not just renovation or reju reju rejuvenization? Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, rejuvenation? Reju rejuvenation. Rejuvenation. Yeah. Rejuvenation, yes. Uh, and if you were to problemize that a little bit more. So should we start with... It's both to, to uh, Iris and to, to Kevin here. Yeah, I guess it touches on Kevin's uh, mm. talk about the, basically the, the annoying bureaucracy of trying to build. And yeah, so I think one aspect of it is that is, you know, kind of recapturing the carbon investment that we've already made in in different kinds of construction. And I think, and you know, demolition is one of the most problematic parts of, you know, of, of construction you know, of new projects. So I think part of the idea of with this kind of low rise is that a lot of existing buildings can just stay in place. And you could really have a substantial change in density and a, and a really substantial kind of overall strategy without having to kind of completely have a new clean slate. So I think, I think, um, I think reestablishing and extending the kind of previous carbon investment, I think is a really important part of it, even if you're not just renovating a building. Exactly. Yes. Iris, would you like to extend on maybe the hurdles you've experienced? When yeah, so I, I also want to add one other aspect to it. I think also the price of the ground is a very important factor for the communities. So if you leave the ground to the investors, that will uh, raise the cost enormously. But if we have seen um, urban models where the price of the ground was fixed, and then you had to apply with uh, a project and the outcome was much more interesting and also the price was not so elevated. Yeah, So there was more concurrency for the ground, but the, the community was really taking care of the price of the ground. Um, then your other question was, um, if we can, how can we look in the future? Yeah, so... 
I understand renovation cannot always happen, but I think you, as the new generation of architects, this is one of the tasks you have to tackle to use your creativity in architecture to continue. Uh, use your abilities um, to, to continue what you find, give it a new sense, uh, find new models, find new textiles, find your methods, and you will be needed. And I think we have to get used to the aesthetic outcome. It might be different uh, than everything is homogeneous. It might be that we get we have to get used to a, a aesthetic, uh, new aesthetic, but uh, the carbon footprint is really, really important. And also the social question, the, s the people have to be a factor. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, I mean, adding to that, I think your question is really touching the core of this seminar. And I think, I mean, looking at both your talks, I mean, and also Søren's talk and the previous, uh, previous talks here today, I mean, this very much has to do with mindsets. I mean, to accept transformation as a means of, 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 of driving development and design, not only the clean slate like, like, like Kevin talked about. I mean, uh, there is mindsets out there that, that I mean, the most, most normative way of, 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 of developing and mo often the most cheapest way is to just clean the slate and to build, the, you know, things that you've done before, you know, s known solutions. That's a safe and easy way to kind of ad advance uh, development. But it's really problematic for many reasons, for, for, sustainable, for, for sustainability reasons, but also for, you know, for um, new economies and new cultures to create spaces for uh, new economies and new cultures to push these things forward. Like you talked about, this requires new aesthetics, it requires new spaces, it requires creativity on all different levels in order to kind of accomplish this. Uh, to me, it's so interesting to see, I mean, uh, Kevin talks about the transformation of Los Angeles, a city, right? How that transformed through incremental kind of actions. And, and, uh, and, and, and you're talking about the transformation of kind of, of post-industrial sites or industrial plants that normally has been just torn down. We see it here in Sweden on an everyday basis, how, how, how municipalities and, de and developers just tear down things because it's, too, it's, it's, it's easy, right? So I think shift, shifting mindsets is very important. This is definitely a role and a responsibility we have. And you guys, you know, being the new new generation, we we push you, and I hope you will push you no know, further. But I think we also, uh, I think we give students a, a kind of false impression that that projects are about some kind of invention that they have and then it's implemented. And, and, and I think that's why we kind of, you know, we've always had this idea that intervention is a, it's a narrow art, but a more complicated one. And I, and I suspect in 2000 when the, you know, they said, well, no, we're just going to like take this industrial wasteland and, and <clears throat> watch me work, you know, that would have been a hard sell, especially back then. But the the outcome is a really is is a really profound one, and and I think you know I think we really need to be careful about the kind of tendency to imagine that there's always a new beginning, and mm -hmm. and and I think from a sustainability standpoint, imagining or kind of asking yourself like how little do I need to make this happen? You know, what's the most minimal needs? You know, and really kind of connect aesthetic minimalism with a sustainability strategy, then I think, then the kind of existing environment starts to look a lot different. But, yeah. but still, I, I would like to add something to this. I think we, um, we have to make an effort. I like this in your talk that you said we have to resist. We find sites which are completely polluted, which are inaccessible. And uh, I really think it's up to us and it's up to you to really use research, to use new strategies and make a society effort to make these sites accessible, usable, and for this you need innovation. And it's not, uh, I, it's, I understand in terms of housing and in terms of, New materials, yes. We have also seen this in the lecture of CERN. I really liked his little unit in the end, which is uh, g having a great potential. 
Um, but in terms of ground, we have challenges which are enormous. And now we have a war in Ukraine. We have we will find territories which are completely polluted. Yeah, so. It, there is a society and we are the building disciplines. We have to give solutions and find ways to clean these sites, make them fertile again, make them accessible for a normal public, for social well-being, for use of everybody. And it's our discipline. It's, we don't have to wait for others to do the job. We have to do it. And so everybody has to make an effort, also in research. Yeah? Mm. Mm. Uh, and we're talking about the, the, the action that architecture is something we do and we have our special skills. Uh, and when we started discussing about this panel and seeing what sort of uh, which common denominator we have here within our speakers, we were with, we're thinking about what we share. We were saying like no sustainability without sharing. Uh, and the, here we also comes to this fact that the, the land is limited, it's also misused sometimes, we, we've got to do something with it, but it's a matter of sharing and it's interesting seeing how you, in your, uh, with your experience, within your uh, practices, how you deal this special, this thing about sharing space in various scales. Uh, and if you could just let us know, are there certain project where you think this has become the, the uh, key agent for the drive of, of, of the project itself, the, the shared space in various scales. So I'll start with you, uh, Kevin. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we've always tried to find ways of getting the project to spill a little further than the kind of limits of the building itself. Um, so I think, yeah, and usually what we've done is taken something that is a necessity, exiting circulation and things like that, and turn it into something that has a social kind of program. Um, and I think that that's something that probably appears in a lot of the housing projects. Um, I think it I think it has a lot of potential in the little low rise because I think as you kind of compress footprints and make houses smaller, you also, in a climate like Los Angeles, push people to the outdoors. And so then it kind of becomes a shared kind of outdoor environment. And people have a lot of privacy inside and then a much more shared kind of environment outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also talked about the ADUs, the accessory dwelling. For those of you who don't know, the accessory dwelling units, uh, in Swedish, what would we say? Attefallet, Like smaller units might not need permission even. Yeah, yes. Where we also where you uh, where we looking into Los Angeles and, and the and the use of land that actually forms the character of the city itself and creates these problems. You, you uh, talked about both regarding distances, but also value of land. Uh, so. Have you seen any impact of the ADUs? You, there was new legislation, for example? Yeah, there, there was new legislation. I think it's now the most kind of frequently issued building permit. It's still slow because, you know, people have to hire somebody to draw the plans and, you know, f hire a contractor and do all those things that are, are not necessarily second nature for a lot of people. So that's one of the reasons we're trying to kind of take on this idea of rationalizing the most problematic part of it. And it's really not regulatory. It's more like adding kind of a level of certainty, you know, where people would know exactly what it would cost to get the kind of basic structure in place. And then they don't have to wait and talk to a contractor to find that out. Mm. So you wouldn't say it really changes the structure on a whole? It's sort of yeah, I mean, I, and I think it will continue to. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, because it's, I think because each of those ADUs goes in a parcel that is owned by an individual, it's less likely to get objections from, you know, people who might object to a, a larger project that mm. is in a commercial yeah. strip. That leads us into another question that we had. Mm. Maybe you would like to start this one, Iris. Mm -hmm. So it's connected to the legislation. So which long-term effects do you see uh, on governmental bodies or legislation as a consequence of your projects or your visions? 
Yeah, we can see already now that we're, uh, there's a shift at the moment. So, the, for example, uh, Metropole de Lyon, for them, is uh, evident that they think more in processes than in objects. And also with the new uh, European Bauhaus, you all know, uh, we, we have new categories, new ways of thinking uh, about um, qualities. Uh, it's we, we want to achieve as a society uh, in terms of built environment, uh, how do we conceive uh, urban space? And um, this will really affect us in the coming years. Uh, we can see this really strongly in, in all sort of uh, communal departments which, which are very ambitious and look uh, to, to be ready for the future. I mean, city imbalance, for example, is a big issue in, in Munich and uh, we look in the sectors where we have the biggest problems to really help with creativity to rise the urban quality. And I think this is a good, uh, I mean, we have to look at so many things. We have to look at the energy level, we have to look at the society, uh, climate, uh, um, cool islands, um, and then also social housing that everybody can find a flat or an apartment which is affordable. But um, in terms of politics, yes, we see there is a shift. I mean, at least what I can see from the countries which are close by, uh, I don't know in Sweden, you, mm. you know better than I do, yeah. But it's amazing to, s to hear that there is a shift. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There, there is a shift. Oh. Can you also, because you refer when you were talking about your project in Lyon and you talked about the dialogue with, with the users and so have you seen a shift there as well that it's sort of involved, there's more of involvement, one expects the involvement of yeah. the public? Yeah, yeah, there's more involvement, there's an expectation to the site and what you receive is what you also participated. There's a, I think that's not a big surprise because you have been part of the project since the beginning. You know what is going on and this is what you have been shown in your process too. Um, I thought it was really refreshing this morning to, to see how if you implement the right strategies, you can come out with a resu shared result. Yeah? Mm. But isn't it quite important here that when we talk about these things and we talk sustainability and uh, we talk sharing, uh, we, uh, there are so many buzzwords, we say dialogue, uh, it's, it's all this, uh, mm, we know what we mean and sort of tick the box, it's done. And then it's a question of when does it work, do we, s do we see it happening? You ask the question, how does it work here? And I, I could say there are moments when you see a real dialogue, when you see an effort for, from architects, from uh, municipalities and having things taken step by step and where you have an involvement. But you also see these times when you send out the, the, uh, the date for, for a, this formal dialogue, you know, just the night before midsummer eve, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, decisions taken. So, so uh, what should we say? We have actually, we have uh, in the audience from Lund, I know that you work a lot with Brunsberg, for example, an area just outside here with dialogue. Have you, s do you think it has increased this kind of uh, involvement? Do you see an involvement from, from the public? <laughs> and now we don't have microphones, I'm just no, doing but something if out they, of No, but if they answer, we could repeat it. Mm. Yeah. So what we're here, trying lots of different methods. Exactly, and maybe also thinking in uh, steps. 
So you have a first step and then you have a second step where you invite everyone who started to live in the area and invite them to a dialogue, which I think could be quite successful, quite engaged. Mm. So stage two will be decided in Brunsberg based on the sort of collaborative knowledge and the hearing. Yeah. Another buzzword which also has to do with, with the um, shared space is when we talk mötesplatser, meeting points, places to, to meet, uh, which we always want to that could be something we tick off or we say, oh, here's, we designed this so people can meet. And I think, isn't that a sign when you, if, if you know how, if you have the, the skills to understand, to design, it's sequences of spaces and also the graduation in between um, the very public and the semi-public and the semi-private and fully private. And that is a skill that architectures should hold. But it's also a matter of uh, participation, understanding, listening. And I must say, when, when I heard now um, Sandy and when we saw your work up in Bodan earlier this morning, um, when you suddenly start seeing things where do you really understand the user? Are you, I'm happy to hear when Eva says here that you invite the public and you will listen and you don't make decisions until you've heard what is the response. But if, when you start doing something, you impose something and you just don't know the user. Uh, I was shocked. I, I felt ashamed of when I saw the kind of um, how, how you... Well, first just... Um, having this refugee uh, center up there located in, in a place like that without without uh, having a social idea about uh, how you welcome someone who comes. But then when you see something working and we saw this uh, living room, this sort of open corner of this uh, empty artifact almost, this building, this object standing there, suddenly it's, it got life and we saw something and then there it was just closed down. Um, yeah, it's uh, this film did something, and exactly. we yeah we there said a, yeah. should we start <laughs> petitioning petitioning yeah exactly. yes but there is a big need and a shift in legislation mm. and the power structures mm. when it comes to these sort of uh, initiatives mm. for them to be su like sustained in the long run. Mm. I wondered maybe do we have another question from the audience possibly. I just maybe I would like to add what you said before. I think it's important to have also a vision as an architect or as a planner and then hear what is demanded, but also transform it and develop a concept or a process or a vision and also be strong and defend it and uh, see that we can do this journey together. Yeah? And you have in the end an outcome. Everybody is happy, also your client and residents and but also it should have uh, some aesthetic quality or some social quality uh, sustainable qualities um, and there's a knowledge behind that mm. yeah yeah i would say in los angeles now <clears throat> there are I, I think there are 150 identifiable neighborhood groups in the city Many of them have kind of weaponized the kind of process of community outreach to prevent projects from happening. And so there's a big reconsideration now in the city to re-examine the kind of outreach process to confirm whether or not people who are being excluded are actually more likely to be included. Because basically the kind of the process that's been really formalized of, of community outreach and community participation has really just kept people away. And so there's a real effort now to kind of change that relationship and change that power dynamic. Um, because basically in these neighborhood groups you get people who are homeowners, but not potential renters. And, and giving those people a voice ends up being a, a really substantial challenge. 
Um, and that's one of the things that a lot of the people in the city are now trying to take seriously and, and, and really trying to identify a process with which people who are the kind of true constituents of the city um, can, can really can be more engaged in the process. And I think in, and I think in the worst case scenario, the kind of community outreach has kind of propagated this, this notion of us and them and this, this kind of concept of the other. And, and we've been, we've had, you know, meetings where people, I mean, it's, it's just the, the comments you get are just so unbelievable. You know, people will say, well, I believe in affordable housing, but you know, those people have cars that leak oil and, and I'm really an environmentalist. And, you know, just the craziest comments and, you know, and you kind of think, you really didn't just say that, did you? But, you know, but they do. And, and, I, think, and I think that's one of the real challenges of this kind of consensus building is that you can build a, real, a false consensus. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's an okay. Nimbian theory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It really is weaponized. Huh. So um, I think we had a question, actually, from the audience. Yeah, let's hear Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was really happy to hear that almost all the practices uh, presenting today uh, have something in common, which is that we seem to be uh, researching architecture uh, even without clients. Uh, that, and I think that is really important for students to uh, understand how that works, because that's part of an office uh, or a business to develop things without having uh, being paid for it in the first stage, that it's not relying uh, on clients. Uh, sometimes you do, like Servan talked about one Princeton, they have been researching uh, housing for like 50 years, uh, and uh, Kevin, you talked about this uh, Low rise project, which is a kind of great investment in some way to research that within the office and in contact with other people. And I think the same goes for uh, Iris and uh, Lena as well. That we have this kind of process going. Could you say something more about that? Mm. How it can fit to your offices? Yeah. So Jesper would like to know more about maybe architectural research as an agent in your design process. Hmm. I would. Do you understand? Well, for us, it's a culture. Well, we we function like that since Peter Lars established all this curiosity in uh, these architectural elements, and we for us it's normal. Yeah, we research into each project, we start with the, what is given, what can be a potential for the next future development, what is really interesting in it, what gives patina, what gives a sense. And so I think uh, this is something which is in our DNA of the office, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Kevin, would you? Well, I, I think for us, it's, you know, I think we, Like I said, we, you know, we believe in intervening in systems rather than imagining you're going to invent a new thing. And, and I think part of that is just a really systematic way of, of looking at the way things done are done or the way things, are, you know, what things are made of or what material properties exist. And, and looking for kind of, you know, what's the unexploited, you know, characteristic of this? You know, what... what is you know what is implicit but not manifested in a technique or a system or a process or a practice and really try to use that and make that a really significant and clear part of our own decision making and say all right well if this is the case what are the implications you know you know here are three possible implications of that let's let's pursue them and really just try to make that a way of thinking about what we're designing. Hmm. So just, it is a process. Uh, if I just can add to that, I think, I mean, perhaps this has to do with the vision that you talked about, uh, the necessity of a vision. I mean, I've been knowing you for 15 years now and you've been working 
it was a very strong design intent with a kind of similar kind of kind of problematics that you can address you know through during during this this time uh, it's really interesting to see the different projects evolving and uh, one thing that i think goes through many of the all of the discussions today i mean it goes in the direction that you're talking about i mean to use problems and challenges not necessarily to solve them, but to use them as engines in kind of creative design processes, the problem becomes an engine, mm -hmm. and uh, it drives ideas forward, right? And it and you test them, and you you know you design them, you build them, you test them, you evaluate them, you kind of drive these processes forward. And I think that's going back to what Eva talked about. I was really happy to hear about this open-endedness that you obviously are w working with starting a process and evaluating and see where see where it goes not necessarily knowing the end product but actually you know going like kevin said in incrementally towards you know something um, i think that's yeah that's nice to hear <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, we have one more question, Christian. No, I'm thinking about the, from, the, from the practicing architects, uh, which is sort of passionate driven, and, and there, there could be sort of a conflict between sort of billable hours, especially in Swedish architectural society and, and, and in the business, of sort of having billable hours uh, and also to have this sort of research driven, uh, also passionate approach. Mm. Mm. I think the the question is about the balance of passion and uh, economics within <laughs> projects in general for our speakers. Yeah, and I must say that that is such a big question uh, that I don't think that we will sort of solve this <laughs> in this <laughs> panel, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> but just keep doing what you love doing because, you know, that is priceless, isn't it? And just knowing that the skills we have are has lots of value and it's more a matter of um, talking about it as something in the terms where, where you where you actually can't put a price on it. But yeah. you know I think especially in practice you know I, and I think that is a real it's a huge challenge but I think it is a, a matter of, of passion with a purpose um, because it really is not this kind of romantic thing that you fall in love with this idea you have it's sort of like all right does this work or not you know, can I get this through the building department? Can I, can I build this? You know, will we be able to explain to a builder what we want? And if you can't, then there's no purpose to it. And so I think, I think a lot of the issues of kind of research are really about being able to kind of like direct the research towards, you know, kind of an objective that you have. Yeah. yeah. So I think that we should actually round off and, and uh, I will um, thank you for taking part of the panel. And thank you. Uh, thank would you. love to continue this discussion and um, per your one, you will round off with a few words. Closing well, words. yeah, Closing. just some quick words. <laughs> uh, it's really been a pleasure here. I hope you've enjoyed the day. Um, uh, to me, it's been such a great boost to have international people joining us here in the department again. And it's really, uh, it's an energy, it gives you energy, uh, really, to have these kinds of, of, of days. So thanks to the guests that took the time to travel here. <laughs> uh, well, now when we have the world op 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 opening up again. And um, I mean, this uh, the idea of this symposium is really founded in in a belief that architects and design have a much more uh, has a much a bigger role to play in in societal development than we often see, particularly here in, here in Sweden, but perhaps also, of course, internationally. Uh, and uh, we talked about several things. Here. I don't want to re re repeat it, but but uh, but uh, it's great to see these examples of, of 
of, of, of architecture that really pushes the boundaries and try to get engaged in different ways that is beyond uh, this kind of safe repetitions and kind of business as usual models that we, that we all, all too often see. So I hope this has, this has been, this will be useful for, the, for you, the students. I mean, this is ultimately you guys that we are addressing here. Um, so uh, thank you for attending. Thanks for a great day. Thanks to our guests. And uh, well, see you next year. <laughs>